Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Councilmember Inez Barron. I'm the chair of the Committee on Higher Education. And today, November 20th, is Latina Equal Pay Day, which means that this is the day when Latina pay catches up, catches up to that of white, non-Hispanic men from last year. Today's oversight hearing is on diversity in higher education and curricula in the City University of New York, CUNY. CUNY has long been recognized as one of the most diverse university systems in the United States, and in fact, it operates pursuant to a legislatively mandated mission to, quote, maintain and expand its commitment to academic excellence and to the provision of equal access and opportunity for students, faculty, and staff from all ethnic and racial groups and from both sexes, end quote, as well as to be, quote, of vital importance as a vehicle for the upward mobility of the disadvantaged in the city of New York. CUNY's mission also acknowledges, quote, the imperative need for affirmative action, the imperative need for affirmative action, and the positive desire to have city university personnel reflect the diverse communities which comprise the people of the city and state of New York. In fact, a vast and growing body of research suggest, suggests that a diverse student body, faculty, and staff increases creativity, innovation, and problem solving among students regardless of background. A diverse faculty can also serve as role models for diverse students who may be emboldened while studying with someone with whom they can relate. However, over the past decade, the number of diverse tenured faculty and administrative officials has decreased. This has led to concerns over college curricula, which has traditionally emphasized the Western canons, which is defined, quote, as high culture, literature, music, philosophy, and art, and is highly valued in the West. Whereas we know that Africa is, in fact, the cradle of civilization, the origins of Homo sapiens, and that arts, culture, written language, philosophy, astronomy, math, monotheism, uh, land cultivation, and technology all began in Africa. And the result of the emphasis on Western culture has resulted in the marginalization of cultural expressions of people and countries of color and a focus on the works of white men. Additionally, through the racial and ethnic makeup of the CUNY student body as a whole, it reflects the diversity of the city. It is a different story at the university's so-called higher performing colleges, which serve predominantly white and Asian students. While the number of women enrolled at CUNY is greater than the number of men, apart from Baruch College and the New York City College of Technology, CUNY does not track enrollment with regard to gender outside of the binary and further lacks data with regard to students and faculty who identify as LGBTQ. At this hearing, the committee would seek to overview how CUNY works to promote its pluralistic community, which has been shown to be fundamental to the exchange of ideas and knowledge and scholarly discourse. Additionally, the committee is interested in learning about how CUNY capitalizes on its diversity, including race, national origin, ethnicity, religion, age, gender, sexual orientation, gender identity, disability, and socioeconomic status to create a vibrant academic, intellectual, and cultural environment that goes beyond representation to general participati participative membership exemplifying the benefits that accrue when diversity and inclusion are integral parts of the institution's curriculum. Last May, CUNY named then Queens College President Felix Matos Rodriguez as its chancellor. At the as the university's first Latino chancellor, I look forward to hearing concrete examples of outcomes and CUNY's efforts to increase and improve diversity both within the classroom and in the curriculum. Now, I'm going to ask uh, the, I'd like to thank my staff, Joy Simmons, my chief of staff, and Indigo Washington, my legislative director, and CUNY liaison, Chloe Rivera, the, the committee's senior policy analyst, 
Paul Senegal, counsel for the committee, and Michelle Pendergrin, the committee's finance analyst. And in accordance with the rules of the council, I will ask the council to administer the affirmation to the witnesses from the mayor's administration. Please raise your right hand and the council will administer the oath. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council members' questions? Please state your names for the record. Good afternoon, Chairperson Barron, and members of the Higher Education Committee and staff, thank you for the opportunity to testify before you on the important issue of diversity in higher education's classrooms and curricula. My name is Jose Luis Cruz, and I have the privilege of serving as the Executive Vice Chancellor and University Provost of the City University of New York. I am accompanied here today by two esteemed colleagues to whom I will in due course yield the floor so they can provide the committee some specific examples of the many ways in which CUNY's campus communities are collaborating to, quote, capitalize on the university's diversity to create a vibrant academic, intellectual, and cultural environment in its classrooms and curricula, the topic of this hearing. Carol Mason, president of John Jay College of Criminal Justice, and Christine Mangino, provost of Austos Community College, will testify after my remarks. Last year in my role as president of Lehman College and co-chair of the university's faculty diversity working group, I had the opportunity to testify before this committee and left with a full appreciation for the concerns raised during the proceedings about CUNY's approach towards diversity among its faculty, including a perceived lack of accountability for campus efforts to diversify faculty, lack of clarity on reappointment, tenure, and promotion standards among faculty of color, and the unevenness in and differences between student and faculty diversity across and within campuses. Today I come before you on my fourth month as CUNY's chief academic officer to state that my confidence in advancing the future is now a conviction for bettering the present. Because to effectively promote our university's pluralistic community and create a vibrant educational, intellectual, and cultural environment that goes beyond representation to genuine participative membership, we must build decidedly upon the strong foundation that has been laid and move purposefully from plans and studies to actions and accountability. The first step to do this is to problematize the issue of diversity in the classroom and curricula and recognize that notwithstanding the position of strength from which our university approaches this issue, the complexity inherent in the work requires both cultural and structural solutions because the reality is that by any objective measure, CUNY is a national leader in the issue of diversity in higher education classrooms and curricula, with the most diverse student body in the country and the percentage of our faculty representing minority backgrounds being approximately twice the national average. But the fact remains that we have work to do. For instance, in my time at CUNY, I've been in the room when a provost decided to communicate to the members of a search committee that they needed to go back to the drawing board because there was insufficient diversity in the candidate pool. Upon reviewing the screening rubrics and rating sheets, the provost asked the Office of Compliance and Diversity to determine if there were additional minority candidates the search committee could consider. As a result, a highly qualified Hispanic candidate was identified, added to the pool, and ultimately hired. I've been in the room when a junior faculty member of color who had just received a sample syllabus for a general education course sighed loudly when realizing the disconnect between the college experiences of the protagonists in the course's main reading and those of the students she knew to expect in her classroom. And I was there when she immediately resolved to actualize and localize the readings to not only better engage her students, but also capitalize as a result on the diversity that they bring to classroom discussion. I've been in the room when a faculty member presented compelling data to disabuse those who for years had intimated that the pass rates of students in a gateway science class was destined to be around 30% because for years it had been so and the characteristics of the students enrolled in the college had not changed. Through innovations in pedagogical deliveries, this faculty member had shown that the pass rate of those students could not only be increased to 80%, but their learning could be demonstrated to be on par with that of students in a sister institution 
whose student body had SAT scores that were on average 200 points higher. In doing so, she did much to push back against the soft bigotry of low expectations that keeps so many from having the supports and investments they need to meet their full potential. And I've been in the room when a member of a faculty promotion committee for a female African-American candidate expressed concerns about the emphasis on the black experience and lack of European-inspired voices in the faculty's scholarly work. I had barely just registered what had been said when another member of the committee firmly, respectfully, and successfully made the case that the flip of that argument would not be applied to a white male faculty member specialized in European scholarship. That is, no one would be questioning why said faculty member did not speak more about the black experience in their work. The African American faculty member, needless to say, was promoted. And so it is, because we acknowledge that issues of diversity play out in different ways in different spaces, and that they not always turn out as well as in the examples I have just shared with you here today, that I welcome the opportunity afforded to me to inform the committee about what the university, under the leadership of Chancellor Felix Matos Rodriguez, is doing to further enhance the diversity of CUNY's classrooms and curricula. Diversity and pluralism are deeply ingrained in the CUNY value system. With its home in the nation's largest, most diverse city, CUNY recruits and attracts a student body that is extraordinarily diverse in language, culture, religion, race, ethnicity, geography, family income, age, sexual orientation, gender identity, and educational background. In fall 2018, for example, CUNY's physical and virtual classrooms hosted nearly 245,000 undergraduate students representing 209 ancestries, of whom 56.8% were female, almost 80% people of color. To put some of these numbers in context, according to recent IPEDS data, BMCC alone has 1.5 times as many students of color as the entire Ivy League. Similarly, Lehman College on its own enrolls 80% as many students of color as the entire Ivy League. But we know that to truly capitalize on this diversity in the classroom, we must do more to recruit and retain faculty who understand that a student's identity in regards to race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, age, disability, and socioeconomic status is fundamental in the individual learning process as well as the educational progress of the class as a whole. In summary, the diversity in CUNY's classrooms is activated in part, not by any means exclusively, through 39 academic majors across 11 campuses, leading to AA, BA, MA, MS, advanced certificates, and PhD degrees in fields such as African, and African di diaspora studies, Puerto Rican and Latino studies, Judaic studies, Middle Eastern studies, and East Asian studies, women's gender and sexuality studies, disability studies, among others. It is also activated through 128 pathways courses classified under the core area of US experiences in its diversity, spanning subjects such as evolution and expressions of racism, African American history, black poetry, and philosophical visions of American pluralism, and an additional 167 pathways courses under the core area of world cultures and global issues. In fall 2018, nearly 1,000 students enrolled in the aforementioned programs, while 25,000 enrolled in courses in the identified core areas. To move the diversity agenda forward, CUNY is organizing its work to expand access to diverse students, better support faculty hiring and retention processes, and evaluate the effectiveness of its general education offerings, among other initiatives. First, we're actively working to scale proven P16 initiatives that serve as an efficient pipeline of student enrollment that begins at the earliest, earliest stages of one's educational journey. Second, we are actively working to enhance the climate on our campuses through the strategic use of recent collaborative on academic careers in higher education, COACH, survey results in which faculty of color satisfaction was seen to improve in all the surveyed benchmarks. And third, we are actively working on an evaluation of the pathways curricular structure to develop a comprehensive understanding of how it contributes to student momentum and how students experience pathways at the campus level. Finally, from an accountability perspective, Chancellor Felix B. Matos Rodriguez recently instructed all presidents and deans to establish and state specific goals on the diversity of faculty, staff, and administrators that would then be assessed as part of their personal performance evaluations. CUNY has long understood that a vibrant exchange of ideas and perspectives within the classroom is informed by identity. 
This leads not only to a more engaging and inclusive learning process, but also increases retention as students want to continue classes in which their individual identity and cultural background is not only respected and reflected, but integral to the functioning of the class as a unit. It is this sense of community that will go on to create positive outcomes outside of the classroom. Take, for example, the nursing program at Lehman College. Key to the program's pedagogy is the intention to harness the collective power of those individuals in the classroom who represent a diversity of races and ethnicities. Graduates from the program then export that diversity-based education and their diversity training when they head out into the field, thus bettering the community at large through the administration of effective, culturally sensitive healthcare. In this way, Lehman's nursing program exemplifies the positive ripple effect of capitalizing on diversity in the classroom and the curricula. For this and so many other reasons, I stand here today optimistic about what lies ahead. I will now yield to my esteemed colleague, the Provost of Austin's Community College, Dr. Christine Mangino, who after delivering her testimony, will turn it over to President Carol Mason from the John Jay College of Criminal Justice. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair. Good afternoon, Chairwoman and Barron and members of the Higher Education Committee. My name is Christine Mangino and I am the Provost and Vice President for Academic Affairs at Ostos Community College of the City University of New York. At Ostos Community College, we are intentional in the representation of inclusion and diversity throughout our course curriculum and extracurricular activities. This is part of the mission of the college and our general education learning outcomes. For example, we have a capstone course entitled Bronx Beautiful as the culminating class for our liberal arts students. Part of the course description states, students will understand how their education can help them become more aware, educated, and involved members of their communities, and therefore empower them to become agents of change. Another way we involve our students in the community is through our service learning curriculum. There are guidelines to become a designated service learning course through a governance-led approval process. Some elements are a reflection component and outcomes related to our global citizenship general education outcome. Most of the CBOs we have partnered with work with diverse populations and inclusiveness is part of their missions also. Two of our English faculty have been collaborating with the Columbia University's Common Core. Our focus has been on connecting with authors who write about feelings of alienation, conflicted identity, and oppression. A highlight is the inclusion of Du Bois, the soul of black folk, and focusing on the concept of double consciousness and the sense of double identity black people carry with them in a predominantly white society. We have an interdisciplinary faculty committee revamping our liberal arts degree to include options in women's and gender studies, the black and African diaspora studies, and healthcare management whose focus is understanding current health issues such as health inequality and cross-cultural and interpersonal communications. There is a new G LGBTQ course going through our governance process. Within our aging and health studies degree program, our faculty discovered the need to incorporate curriculum on cultural sensitivity. This need was discovered when surveying employers who provide our students internships. In collaboration with our career services staff, we developed two sets of curriculum. The first is now embedded in all the aging and health studies courses, and the second has become a workshop our career services staff provide all students participating in internships. The handbook, entitled The Roadmap to Cultural Sensitivity, The Journey to Cultural Awareness, has outcomes which include students will develop an increased self-awareness of differing culturally-based values and beliefs of individuals and organizations, and to understand the challenges that arise when differences in culture, values, beliefs, and experiences exist between people. Included activities have the purpose of expanding students' understanding of other cultures, building awareness of one's own cultural biases, how to bridge language divides, the importance of nonverbal communication, and the differences between being culturally sensitive and culturally competent. These curriculum have been shared with faculty across the college so that they too can begin incorporating portions into their own courses. For a few years, we designated a faculty member to be a diversity fellow who works with our Center for Teaching and Learning to plan different activities and conversations to discuss diversity, inclusion, and equality. 
We recently had a series of conversations to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall Riots as a way to illuminate our LGBTQ faculty and staff members' journeys on campus. Another recent event yesterday was titled, to Is the Hostos Classroom Really Inclusive? Through a college-wide process, we select a book of the year that faculty can use in their classrooms, and we have college-wide events to discuss the book and suggest in-class activities. Our last four books all speak to themes of inclusion, social justice, and equality. The books were Just Mercy, Americana, How to Think, and this year, it's The Hate You Give. Our social science speaker series runs every semester and highlights these same themes. This semester included upending the ivory tower, civil rights, black power, and the Ivy League, and a blueprint for economic justice, project equality, and black women's economic activism in America's industrial heartland. Our theater productions always focus on themes of social justice and inclusion. Our latest production, which was also performed at this year's Fringe Festival, was The Gender of Attraction, which is about transgender relationships. We promote the creation of cultural, social, and religious clubs, such as the Black Student Union, Kaklara Club, the Muslim Club, the Veterans Club, the Reimagining Justice Club, and the African Club. They recently held a multicultural day and added the flags of the Republic of Yemen and Turks and Caicos to represent our student population in our flag collection. Again, these are just some examples of Ostos' inclusive curriculum and all of which speaks to who we are as a college. Good afternoon, Chair Barron and members and staff of the City Council Committee on Higher Education. Thank you for the opportunity to present my testimony this afternoon. One of John Jay's greatest strengths is, is its diverse community. With a richly diverse student body that is 46% Hispanic, our new class is 50% Latinx, 20% black, and 13% Asian, John Jay is recognized as both an Hispanic serving institution and a minority serving institution. We are deeply committed to transforming John Jay from merely a Hispanic and minority enrolling institution to a truly Hispanic and minority serving institution. We work to create a space that authentically incorporates the rich diversity of our students' heritages into our curriculum and programming. I will highlight some of our diversity and inclusion efforts in the classroom and across campus. John Jay's historic mission and focus on criminal and social justice exists alongside the college's educational values and commitment to inclusion. Using best practices and student-centered pedagogies, classroom tools and training, we are strengthening inclusion. This fall, through our Teaching and Learning Center, we are expanding the design and use of inclusive curricula at the college through year-long faculty seminars, a working group, and six curricular intervention projects. More than 50 faculty, 24 of color and 36 who are women, are rewriting syllabi, developing culturally sustainable course content and assignments, and enhancing their understandings of the context in which their students experience historical oppressions and individual traumas through structured discussions and the study of research on racism, sexism, gender identity bias, ethnic and religious hatred, and other forms of discrimination. To foster a more vibrant and inclusive learning environment, they are working to include publications, biographies, and images of authors from diverse backgrounds in assigned readings and viewings. These changes help us provide our students with role models who reflect their self-images and who inspire them to believe they can succeed. Additionally, the Teaching and Learning Center is advising faculty and staff to use inclusive language and apply social psychological interventions that support students' sense of belonging at the college and their development of resilient qualities in response to oppression and trauma. Some of these initiatives build upon two intensive lecture series we held in the spring and fall of 2018 that highlighted best practices for Hispanic serving institutions while partnering with other projects already in process that focused on culturally responsive pedagogy for infusing multicu multicultural content across academic programs. An inspiring example can be seen in the efforts of our HSI, Hispanic Serving Institution Faculty Working Group, who work on teaching and mentoring practices and improvements. The Teaching and Learning Center also connects with our Presidential Fellows for Curriculum-Driven Student Success Initiative, which I launched in 2018, inviting all full-time faculty to apply. 
We selected six inaugural fellows to pursue faculty design projects, and three of the six presidential fellows projects stand out as examples of inclusive curricula interventions. First, Associate Provost, excuse me, Associate Professor in Psychology, Demas Glassford, has designed activities in the first year seminars to increase students' sense of belonging, work with aligned uh, research for success factors influencing college students of color and growth mindset recommendations. Second, Jill Gross Pfeiffer, also an associate professor in psychology, has redesigned the introductory psychology course to include student activities on well-being and flip the classroom strategies to incorporate culturally sustainable pedagogies. Third, assistant professor and chair of our SEEK department, Monica Sun, has focused on deepening critical race pedagogy skills in her department faculty and students, carrying these through from the first to the third years of coursework. I also acknowledge that our faculty in several departments who through their curriculum development, scholarship, experiential learning, and other unique educational opportunities expose our students to the political, historical, socioeconomic, and cultural possibilities, obstacles, and challenges for achieving global social justice and equity, cross-cultural and intercultural understanding, respect for human dignity, and aware, uh, awareness of human and political rights. In particular, I recognize the leadership of our, both our Latin American and Latinx Studies Department and our Africana Studies Department. We know that it is important for students of color to see themselves reflected in their professors and administrators. John Jay has committed to expanding diversity among our faculty as we hire. To that end, we are engaged in a robust training of all hiring committees in the best practices for diversity and inclusion. This includes instruction about implicit bias in assessing letters and CVs, as well as sharing information about how to avoid biases that can occur in interviews. Additionally, intentionally, uh, we are intentionally building diverse pools of candidates by reaching out to uh, provost and department chairs at HSI and other MSI institutions that produce PhDs so that we can have them in our candidate pool. Fostering a campus climate of inclusion and belonging for all of our members is crucial to advancing our broader educational mis mission of educating for justice in all its dimensions and preparing our students to serve as agents of change, diverse leaders of justice in an increasingly diverse America. Last spring, I engaged an exper expert, um, external expert team from Working Ideal to conduct an institution-wide review of John Jay's culture, prevention programs, and policies specifically related to diversity and inclusion, discrimination, and harassment. The recently released report highlights our strengths as well as our opportunities to draw upon new research and best practices to strengthen diversity, equity, and inclusion across our campus environment and to improve our practices and resources. We are excited to seize upon this in, um, opportunity to use data-driven research to foster a sense of inclusion and belonging in our community. And we've acted upon some of those recommendations, including announcing the creation of a new Office of Diversity, Compliance, Equity, and Inclusion to be led by a vice president to be identified by a national search reporting directly to me. We are piloting enhanced diversity training among our senior leadership and in academic and other departments, among other initiatives. And additional recommendations that we are considering and implementing will take more time um, to identify and marshal the resources to implement them. As we continue to work to change the face of opportunity through higher education and ensure that our college community is a model for inclusion, we thank you and your committee for your support of, of CUNY and the John Jay College of Criminal Justice. Uh, thank you so much for your testimony. And I have questions. I don't know if other colleagues will be joining us, but if they do, they will have questions as well. Now, CUNY, in, CUNY issues a master plan, a master plan every four years, I believe it is. And we're now within the scope from 2016 to 2020. Where in that master plan can I find an entry that will direct me specifically to the plan that CUNY has to increase the number of black faculty, Latino faculty, So I believe uh, the master plan also has a strategic framework associated with it that goes into more detail regarding um, the goals for the university. Um, the 
current strategic framework uh, is called Connected CUNY, and it actually ends this year. Um, the new chancellor uh, is putting forth a process that will generate the strategic framework and the accompanying master plan for the next four years, or the first four years of its administration. In the uh, former uh, strategic framework document, uh, one of the goals was around the creation of knowledge, um, and there it speaks uh, to the uh, hiring of faculty, and I believe, I don't have it in front of me, uh, references the, the mission of the university with res regards to diversity issues in the classroom, in the research, and in the work we do for the communities. I had a complaint uh, in the previous session that there, the previous master plan from 2012-2016 was not in any way evaluated, uh, reflected in the current connected CUNY plan, uh, or continuity, it was like two distinct documents, and that was a criticism that I had. There was no uh, report that says, well, from the previous year's plan for diversity, we were able to accomplish or achieve. How do we make sure that there's some continuity, some evaluation of what you previously set goals to achieve as we go? We don't wanna have three separate documents, so we're having a no new document, how do we ensure that there's some evaluation of what you set out to do as we move to the next mas so-called master plan? That's a very good question. I think um, the, the intent on the chancellor and one of his first actions uh, since becoming chancellor of the City University of New York is to have uh, several um, fronts of accountability. So first and foremost, the accountability is to the campus presidents and the professional school deans. And as a result of that, he has, through the goal setting process for the next year, asked each president and dean to establish uh, concrete goals around diversity of faculty, staff, and administrators for their colleges. And those goals will then be used at the end of the year for the chancellor to evaluate each one of the presidents on whether or not they uh, made progress towards those goals. So that's at the most basic administrative level. As we move forward to develop the new strategic plan and its accompanying master plan, um, the issue of diversity will be front and center, um, not only for uh, what it represents in terms of the student body and how that the student body is um, represented across all of our colleges, um, but of course also with faculty, staff, and administration. Um, we intend to have um, a clear performance, key performance indicators associated with the goals. Um, as you know, uh, typically in higher ed and elsewhere, uh, goals are very aspirational, um, but they should also be uh, quantifiable. And so uh, that is part of the strategy that our new chancellor uh, will be putting forward. And hopefully that will provide for the continuity that the chairwoman has uh, alluded to. Who will be a part of the group of persons who come together to in fact uh, create the strategic plan which, which generates the master plan. Who are the people and on what levels and what's the composition of those persons involved in so that? So those, uh, the process that will be used uh, to develop the new strategic uh, plan is currently still being discussed with the new administration. Um, generally speaking, I will say that there will be representation from not only the, the system uh, office but of the campuses as well and of course from the different stakeholders um, that, that span the university. So faculty, staff, students, and administrators will be clearly represented. Um, there uh, is a conversation around how to best engage the communities that we serve um, in providing feedback and guidance as to uh, what those goals should be and how they should be prioritized. Um, I will be happy to uh, come back to uh, the committee with uh, more information once those plans are more concrete. Is there, if I were to look at the organizational chart for CUNY, would I see a designated person who is in charge of looking at how we're moving forward to achieve the diversity goals that we set? So the intention right now is uh, that that be a joint uh, responsibility of the Office of the University Provost, particularly as it respects to uh, the faculty angle and uh, the Office of Human uh, Resources, which um, has uh, just recently appointed a new vice chancellor. 
And so I am very much looking forward uh, to her uh, first day, and uh, we will be uh, working together to figure out what the best way to make sure that we bridge the existing gap between our aspirations on this matter and our current state of affairs. So the two of you would be the persons that would spearhead that? Yes. Okay. In your testimony, you have some references to um, the processes that are used to select from the candidates that come forward. And I'm trying to find it. Um, okay, uh, you indicate that in the 2017-18 year, there was uh, page five, the university-wide applicant pool by race, ethnicity for 90 searches with underutilization. So as I recall, there are particular areas that CUNY calls underutilization. I think it's science. Can you refresh my memory about sure. what those areas of underutilization are? Of course. So basically, the underutilization um, is a technical HR term mm -hmm. uh, associated with the Equal Opportunity Act. And it, the way that it is used within CUNY and most higher ed institutions across the country is at the department level. Right. So we will look at if there is a search that will be done for a faculty member at a particular department. Depending on the discipline, there is data from the labor department that will suggest what the availability of uh, STEM, to your point, right. uh, faculty members in, in chemistry, uh, for example, are in terms of gender and race and ethnicity. And so an effort is made when uh, a search is being conducted to ensure that the candidate pool reflects the availability. Um, and a department is said to, be, to have underutilization in, say, female or uh, African American or Latino if the current faculty composition um, uh, in those areas is below the national uh, availability. Um, and so when we m say that there were 90 searches conducted in 2017-18 that had underutilization, that refers to the fact that there were 90 searches um, in departments across CUNY mm -hmm. where there was um, a sense that, um, given the data, that the faculty com was less diverse than it could be given the availability of professionals in those fields. Say that last part again, that last sentence. That the faculty of that particular department right was less diverse than it could be right. with respect to the national availability of uh, professionals in that area. Okay, so your testimony goes on to say that 45% uh, or 3,000 of the 7,000 applicants were from underrepresented minority groups. 3% mm -hmm. were Italian American, 6% were unknown, and 46% were white. What happened to the blacks? Did we leave them out or was it? I'm missing something here. Yes, I believe that um, black applicants are with the, are within the 45%. Within the 45%? Mm -hmm. So the 45% so the, the probably, and I can get that uh, breakdown for you, Chairwoman, uh, includes both um, black and Latino candidates. Okay, I would like to have that disaggregated yes. so that I could see that because that's my issue, that's my concern, that's what I've spoken about very pointedly since I've been here. Where is the black and Latino? Yes. So I really would like to have that disaggregated. And then finally also, um, it says 54, 55% of the total hires were from federally represented minority race ethnicities. 6% were Italian American, 39% white and unknown. So this is not, for me, addressing my concern about where are the black and Latino personnel that we're looking to hire. So it gets back to my opening remarks about the emphasis that's put on Western culture and valuing them more highly, and apparently hiring them in greater numbers than what would be for blacks and Latinos. So I really would like to get that disaggregated if I could have that information. We, we will certainly make that available. The one point I will make um, yes. regarding the data um, is that 45, for those 90 searches with underutilization, 45% of the 
candidates were from uh, underrepresented groups, yet 54% of those hired were from under underrepresented groups, suggesting that some of the processes that have been put in place at the campuses have allowed uh, the, the diversity of the, the underutilization issue to be addressed effectively. Okay, well, I can't really determine uh, for myself uh, the impact that this had in a positive way on hiring black and Latino if I don't have them disaggregated and if they're just simply lumped in what that, because we know that um, Italian Americans are considered underrepresented, underrepresented. They're in that category. So that doesn't for me give me any data as to uh, what number were black and, well, black and Latino. And, and, and we will definitely get you that I just wanna uh, indicate that the Italian American numbers is separate from the 54.4. So 45% okay. were of color and 3% were Italian Americans in the pool. From the hiring, 54% were of color mm -hmm. and 6% were Italian American. Okay. So we will certainly get you better data. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so I do have some other questions as well. In terms of the candidates who are interviewed, do we have the breakdown as to the number of persons, candidates who applied compared to the number who were interviewed at that, and then eventually to the number that were offered a position? Do we have that information as well? Um, and I, I, I'm not talking about the, um, what do they call it? I'm not talking about the group that's called underutilization. Yeah. I'm talking about In system. General. Yes. Yes. So each campus um, tracks that uh, through their search processes. Um, I haven't been at the central office long enough to know if we have uh, the aggregated data. I believe we do, but we can get back to you with uh, the direct information. Okay. Great. Perhaps my colleagues uh, can speak to how it's tracked on the campus level. So within the campus, um, they before faculty can bring, a research committee can bring in um, candidates to interview, they need to first submit the list of potential interviewees to our chief diversity officer who has to then certify that the pool is um, representative of the population. And if it's not, then? They go back and they have to expand who they're bringing in for interviews. Okay. And, um, Profe uh, Dr. President Mason, in your testimony, you said that you announced the creation of a new Office of Diversity, Compliance, Equity, and Inclusion to be led by a vice president who will be identified by a national search, reporting directly to you. So has that office been filled yet? No. Okay. I have, uh, this re the report just came to me, um, and I have just worked on the position description, and I'm forming a search committee. We're not using an outside search firm. We're going to use an internal search committee. But I have, um, prior to finalizing the position description, I have been consulting with people across the city and across the country to get the word out that we're going to be looking to hire someone for this position. And then finally, um, how do we address the issue of the department heads who are predominantly white and the, I think, undue influence they have on, in fact, selecting who candidates are who are going to rise through the ranks. It's the old boy network that has so often kept certified, qualified blacks in the uh, lower levels and not allowed them to percolate up to be able to be advanced. How are we addressing that, that breaking that cycle of the old boy network we talk about cultural sensitivities and all of that, but how are we going to actually break through? Are there incentives that we can offer? Are there um, advances that we can make that will help break that network? So we make sure that the search committee itself needs to be diverse. If the department itself does not have enough faculty to represent the diversity that we're looking for, then other faculty from other departments join that search firm. For the most part, our chairs are not chairing the search um, process, 
And then the, each department, the search committee, then submits three names to my office as their recommendations um, so that we make sure that there's a diverse pool. And over the last six years, we've increased the number of diverse faculty from 49% to 56%, so it's now the majority on our campus. And at John Jay, what we've, um, we've had very little hiring authority since I've been here because of fiscal constraints, but this year, we are going to be doing some hiring, and uh, the provost and I are making it clear to the faculty chairs, and uh, we've brought training to the hiring search committees to make sure they understand the implicit bias and how that works in their selection process, and made it clear to them that, that our goal is to have a faculty that looks like our student body. Okay. And, um, Back to the testimony, in your testimony, you didn't have a chance to enter it into the record, but you have an entry that I would like for you to perhaps talk about a little in more in depth. It's about Macaulay. It says Macaulay has enrolled community college students in a bid to, it's on page five again, uh, in a bid to expand opportunities to deserving students who for a lack of, who, for a variety of reasons, have taken indirect routes to college under a pilot program called Macaulay Bridge selected sophomores from Bronx Community College and the Borough of Manhattan Community College who earned their associate degrees in the spring and then continue as Macaulay at Lehman College students. Uh, and can you talk a little bit more about that program? Because I think Macaulay has also been one of the programs that has a limited number of African American students. So I'm interested to know more yes. about this approach. This is, uh, and I'm personally uh, very gratified by this uh, particular project as I was the president of Lehman College when I had the opportunity to work with uh, President Second Egby from um, Bronx Community College in, uh, initially and Mary Pearl, the dean of the Macaulay Honors College. So the program basically um, is important for two things. One, it's a concrete example of how Macaulay is trying to ensure that it expands access and, and provides access to more diverse students. Um, and the way, and it also is important because it's looking at how we can use pedagogy in an effective way to accelerate the learning of students that may not have been um, uh, prepared academically for uh, uh, the Macaulay Honors College upon graduation from high school, but uh, in short order uh, with the right uh, supports uh, can uh, get to the level where they can join the Macaulay Honors Program during their junior and senior years. Um, so right now we have approximately 20 students um, that started at BCC or BMCC that have uh, participated in uh, special uh, coursework and support uh, services um, and that will now be uh, transferring uh, to Lehman College as part of their Macaulay Honors experience. Um, a lot of the learning that we are doing in terms of what's effective in the classroom uh, to elevate and accelerate the learning of our students will then not only help this particular project expand, but also hopefully inform how we are doing the same type of work elsewhere. And how were the students selected? So the students were selected uh, by a committee uh, that included, I believe, and, and I will correct myself uh, mm -hmm. after the fact if, if my memory, uh, my recollection is not correct, mm -hmm. um, uh, faculty from Macaulay and uh, Lehman and BCC. That was the original partner. What kinds of criteria were presented to say, oh, this student would benefit and this student might do well? I, I would uh, s request uh, permission to submit that on the record okay. because I will likely not make it justice. <laughs> okay. Okay, good. Um, I had a few more questions. Okay, in terms of the uh, funding, you indicated that there's a hiring, uh, you're not able to hire, hire all of the positions that you would need at, why is that the case? Is it that positions have not been advertised or the budget doesn't allow for those positions to be filled? I have a deficit in my tax levy budget that doesn't allow me to be hiring, so I'm being fiscally um, conservative and as people retire then I use that 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 money that comes from freeing up those salaries to then be able to hire new faculty so how many positions would you say uh, you haven't filled or you could have filled had you had the finances for that 
and right. in which do you find that they're in particular departments? Do yeah. you look to have certain uh, areas fully staffed and others not? So I can't answer it in terms of what I would have done because we don't have a, because we've been operating under this kind of framework for my full term. Um, what we've done is when we make hiring decisions, when we do have the availability, the provost looks at the departments and makes a lot of determinations based on um, how many students are not being taught by full-time faculty uh, and looking at a number of facu factors in order to determine where to hire. So it's not if a department loses a faculty member that doesn't necessarily backfill to that department. We take the position and look and see where the need is across the college. Okay, so what? So for example, uh, as you can imagine, and as I've often said, I'm very much interested in the African American studies and the African American departments. What kind of impact does this kind of setting have on not having funding or not having the personnel in a particular African American studies department at a particular university? I was going to say that um, I'm, I'm probably not articulating this clearly enough. Okay. That's a bit because the, I think that what I'm talking about, the, the ratio of full-time faculty to adjunct faculty is probably a CUNY-wide um, demographic. And so um, we depend a lot on adjuncts, but we do have a core, strong core faculty in our Africana Studies Department. Um, and the smaller departments, the factors that we use to determine where to allocate positions factor in the size of the department, so our larger departments are not prioritized over our smaller departments at all. So if a person, I believe, how many persons, how many faculty, how many full-time faculty members are required to actually qualify to be called a department? Is there a, is there a number? So it's not necessarily a, m a number, it's our, the structure based on our charter. So we have units, so our, our black studies unit um, was originally one fa full-time faculty member with a handful of courses and has now grown over the years, but they're then within a department of humanities which has a number of different units within it. So your black studies is within the humanities department? Okay. All right. And, and John Jay is different because we don't have schools. We have everything's an individual department. So we have a separate Africana Studies department. We have a separate uh, Latin American Studies, Latinx Studies Department. We, we have a separate English department. We don't have a School of Arts and Sciences or a School of Humanities. And um, the number of faculty has not been a predeterminant to becoming a department. There so are number factors. of factors, not a predeterminant to there becoming a department. There are a number of factors. That oh, there are a number of factors. Okay. Right. I thought you said faculty. All right, fair. Um, just trying to... And so in your conclusion, uh, in your testimony, you said, clearly CUNY has long understood that a vibrant exchange of ideas and perspectives within the classroom is informed by identity, leads not only to more engaging and inclusive learning process, but also increases retention as students want to continue classes in which their individual identity and cultural background is not only respected and reflected but integral to the function of the class as a unit. What can we do for instructors to in fact have that kind of awareness uh, that, well for presidents I guess, to have that kind of awareness that the composition of the faculty is important to provide role models for the students who are there, to buy an inspiration, to have the, men the mentoring, uh, commonality of uh, common ethnic heritage how important that is as we go through this selection process for hiring and retaining and elevating faculty that reflects CUNY's student population. How can we make sure that presidents understand the value of that? Well, I, I will say having been a president until just four months ago um, and having had the opportunity to co-chair the President's Committee on Faculty Diversity uh, with uh, my colleague Michelle Anderson from Brooklyn College, that I, that I am convinced that our presidents understand uh, the importance of this um, and that they are committed uh, to ensuring that there is a better uh, representation among our faculty that is m uh, more aligned with our student body. Um, I think that the challenges uh, that, that we face, uh, sort of including um, challenges around how quickly we can 
uh, higher uh, faculty um, are, are providing or pacing the, the level at which we can drive change. Um, the mention I made earlier about our new chancellor in his first few months, um, mm -hmm. clearly articulating that this is one of, uh, I believe it's five things, uh, major uh, goals that he wants um, the presence to establish and be accountable uh, for uh, since the, the message that it's not only, all, not only about knowing that it's the right thing, but making sure that we're investing the, the time, talent, and energy to getting the job done. Um, and so I am uh, very optimistic that um, as we come before this committee in, uh, in the future years, we will see a steady uptick in um, the, our ability to move these numbers forward. And at present, I believe there are seven interim presidents at CUNY campuses, York, Queens, Lehman at the senior colleges, Queensboro, Burr of Manhattan, LaGuardia Community Colleges, and the CUNY Graduate Center. Are, are there more than the seven, or are those seven? I think those are That's it. the seven as of now. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. And where are we in the process? How far in the process sure. are we? Are they at different stages, or are they clumped together? And the, there are different along? stages. Um, I believe about three or four of those that you mentioned uh, have searches that are ongoing. Some of them are near completion. Um, and others will be launched in the spring. Do we know which ones are near completion? Do um, you have that? I believe that the Graduate Center uh, is uh, one of them, um, and I believe uh, Baruch College is another. Uh, but we can get you more information on the timeline. Okay, so there must be eight, because I don't have Baruch on my list. So, so Baruch doesn't have an interim Perhaps that's why. Oh, I see. But President uh, Waterstein has announced his retirement. Okay, and they don't yet have an interim. Okay, and we had had some questions uh, at the time that the searches began in terms of. Oh, I want to acknowledge that we've been joined by Majority Leader Lori Cumbo, who is a member of this committee. Uh, we had had some concerns about how how these searches are conducted, and how it is that the community can play uh, a more integral role in having a voice in interviewing candidates and deciding which persons and candidates they feel are a better match for the community. How, how are we moving in that regard? Well, I believe that the search processes, the ones that have already uh, commenced are following the Board of Trustees uh, guidance. Um, and uh, so there is a a search committee that uh, includes, I believe, five uh, members of the Board of Trustees representing the, uh, the public interest, if you will, um, faculty members and administrators. Um, I believe uh, that it includes at least one member from the community uh, at large, um, and, and that is the committee that is in charge of, of doing the, the actual uh, vetting uh, of, of candidates and putting forth the finalists. Um, the finalists will then go through a series of uh, interviews. Um, the nature of those interviews can be open or they can be closed, depending on what the search committee uh, recommends uh, to the chancellor, given uh, tr the trying to balance the um, confidentiality of the process with, uh, obviously, the, the openness of the process. Uh, so. It is a um, possibility that some searches uh, will be open and some will not, um, but that is part of the process as articulated by the board. So once finalists have been selected, why, why would there not be an opportunity for an openness and for that, those finalists to be able to be presented? So there are uh, several... Uh, and because if it's some places yes and some places no, what, what determines that? Well, I think that the, what tends to determine is, is the candidate pool at the end and the willingness of the finalists uh, to uh, participate in an open process. Um, in some uh, searches, and I'm talking now sort of generally higher ed, nationally, mm -hmm. um, the, you will have candidates, finalists, that are sitting presidents, for example, elsewhere, and would withdraw oh. from consideration 
because it would undermine their ability to continue at their current employment. And so that's typically the reason why the boards of trustees as CUNY board have uh, established flexibility in, in determining search by search mm, how to okay. manage them. I see. Okay, uh, I'm sure there'll be more questions that I'll have that I will see as I, um, oh, I did have a question. Uh, in terms of Hostos College, in your testimony uh, on page two, you say that uh, our focus has been on connecting with authors who write about feelings of alienation, conflicted identity, and oppression, and you talk about, so Du Bois' book, who teaches these classes, and what's the experience of the instructors in terms of uh, an awareness of the authenticity of what's in these books? So this specific book is actually being taught by our sociology department, and before anyone teaches in this program, they're going through a year-long um, process of workshops with faculty oh. from Columbia University and colleagues on our campus, they read the book together, discuss issues, and determine how to best select parts of it for our classes and what activities to do in the fall. So we would hope that during this year-long mm -hmm. time there's some sensitivity yeah. and, okay, because I was very, mm -hmm. so this sounds good, but it depends on the position really of, of the persons <laughs> who are teaching it, okay. Um, and also you talk about, there's a handbook the Roadmap to Cultural Sensitivity, The Journal, the Journey mm -hmm. to Cultural Awareness. Mm -hmm. Who prepared that handbook? And you said it has activities uh, for the purpose of expanding mm -hmm. the understanding of other cultures. Who prepared the handbook? So it was a number of our faculty with our career services and our employers um, in the field and what they're seeing with our students in the internships and the missteps some of our students might be doing out in the field to make sure that we're Okay, all right. Um, and then for the students, uh, do we have any kind of survey about the students' opinion of the classes once they have concluded taking the classes? Do we survey, mm -hmm. survey and how is that, how are their responses to their surveys incorporated into what, what generates for the next session? So it's part of our entire ongoing assessment process. So there's surveys at the end of the classes, there's surveys at the end of the workshops with um, career services, and then it informs our practices going forward. But that's across our college as well. Hmm. Wait, we going to oh, okay. And yes, uh, the other question is, mm -hmm. do the students in this survey indicate their response to whether or not they think that the class was inclusive enough in its, pre in its presentation. I would have to go back and get that specific information for you. Okay. From the school. All right. <laughs> okay. As you continue, please get the mic a little closer to you so we're making sure <laughs> that we can record all that. Okay. So the Office of Recruitment and Diversity, uh, the efforts are to recruit and hire ethnically uh, racially diverse faculty, and each individual campus that would then design its plan and submit it, is that how that works? And who reviews the plans and determines whether or not they have met that requirement or the uh, framework that you have set? So at the campus level, it's uh, typically the chief diversity officer mm -hmm. will work with the faculty, the search committees, uh, to ensure that there's a, um, that there is a recruitment plan that will adequately address the issues of underutilization if they exist in the department. And does the central body, the central uh, administration, review each of the plans? We do not review, to my, to my knowledge, we do not review uh, all of the plans. I do know that the data that I shared on the 2017-18 uh, uh, work was sort of a pilot that the Faculty Diversity Working Group uh, led by precedents uh, put in place, and for that one in particular, all of the diversity plans for where there was underutilization were looked at by the central office. Do you think it would be helpful for the central office to review the individual campus that, plans? That is one of the uh, items uh, on my list of things to discuss with the new VP, or I'm sorry, the new vice chancellor of human resources um, around how to structure that work. 
I, I think that it would be helpful, and I'm glad that you're looking at that to see how that could be done. Uh, can you talk about the status of the postdoctoral fellowship program, which was implemented to diversify the pool of potential faculty and attract future leaders into the disciplines? It's called the Postdoctoral Fellowship Program. Yes, I believe that program is uh, one of our um, Mellon funded uh, programs. Okay. I do not have the information with me, but we'll certainly uh, get you an update. Okay, I think that would be helpful because uh, it's described as an initiative to support educational projects, scholarly research, creative endeavors, and professional activities that promote diversity, affirmative action, and multiculturalism. So I understand that it may, it may be uh, an outside funding source, but I think we certainly can benefit from sure. knowing where they are. And additionally, can you talk to us about the status of the faculty fellowship publication program, which is described as developed to assist full-time, untenured fac faculty in the design and execution of scholarly writing projects via group sessions and one-on-one -on -one meetings with an assigned mentor. Faculty fellowship publication program, because I'm not in the academia world, but I understand that it's publish, publish, or die. Yes, yes. So faculty um, are able to apply to CUNY Central, um, and then they're selected, and a number of faculty participate each year, and they do a year-long um, workshop at Central Office with a cohort of other faculty from other campuses to help support each other in their writing, read what they have, give each other feedback, and also hold each other accountable to keep them going in writing. Um, it's been very successful. The faculty on our campus who have participated have all come out with publications, a couple with actual books, and they end up keeping their cohort informally over the years to continue that work. But there, it, what it does is give them also um, a release from one of their courses that they're teaching so that they have time to put towards their writing. Uh, is there any kind of remuneration that they get in accordance with it? I, understand, I heard you say they're released from teaching. Right, but so it, the money goes to release them from the one course, not actual money. So there's no stipend attached um, to this? Sometimes or? they have summer salary. There are certain programs in, within CUNY that will help support them during the summer so that they'll have a summer stipend in order to also do work that way. And what is the status of the Latino faculty initiative, which is designed to, quote, seek to enhance the pool of applicants for faculty and administrative positions at CUNY? Latino faculty initiative. So I will, I will get that information to you. Okay, and do we have a similar plan for black faculty? I will inquire. Okay, I, I've seen the Latino, and, but I would like to know, is there also uh, a plan for a specific target? I mean, everybody should know I'm gonna ask about black. Everybody should know that. Yes. So I would really appreciate getting that information and seeing how we can um, make that a reality because we certainly know that Blacks and Latinos are underrepresented, not only in the underrepresented disciplines, but throughout CUNY. So we certainly want to see how we can do that. Um, Madam Chair, I just yes. wanted to add that uh, as a president who's received the message from our new leadership, it is loud and clear, and I understand the importance of it, and that has given me the ability to go back to my provost and to our faculty chairs to say, this is important, and I will be assessed on how successful this is in that happening and so that that is a clear message from the leadership mm -hmm. um, that allows me to have a little bit more freedom in how I express myself to the faculty when we talk about hiring and we certainly know that what comes from the top is in fact very important and when people see demonstrations that it's not just the conversation but in fact uh, the actions that, that demonstrate that that's in fact the reality, there is oftentimes a change. And I do want to acknowledge that I spoke with the chancellor at length. Uh, he was just very generous with his time. It, it wasn't like a one hour meeting and okay, I have something else. He was uh, open ended with his time and I did in fact impress upon him my major concerns and he was very responsive and gave some personal uh, testimony as to his own um, efforts and successes in bringing black 
president on, so I did hear him and look forward to seeing how we progress. Because this is a golden opportunity for CUNY at this time with so many vacancies, openings, and college president's positions to help facilitate the change that we know is so important. Um, and then just finally, I think, uh, diversity in curricula. Now, we talk about um, the curricula. How are individual course syllabi and reading lists created at CUNY? And how, how effective is a, uh, the individual professor in that, the academic department, and other accrediting factors in determining what would be a part of the course syllabus and reading lists that are created? Every course needs to go through their department curriculum um, committee, and then it goes to a college-wide curriculum committee, and then it goes to our Senate, which is made up of faculty, staff, and students, um, and then it goes to CUNY. So there's a number of eyes on it throughout the process. But I wanted to talk about specifically that you have curricula, and then you have what's really taught in the class. And so what we've been doing at John Jay, again, through our Teaching and Learning Center and part of our Faculty Development Day is we had, um, and I go to our Faculty Development Days, and this past year was really um, eye-opening to see uh, we had a special session on how to diversify your syllabus and make it more culturally relevant. And we brought in students and faculty members. And people, what they did was they brought their syllabus with them, the ones they had planned. And so they could look at it and have this intensive workshop where they talked about this is what it looked like beforehand, this is what it looks like now, and people were really engaged. And so where, you know, you start with, with, with I call your early champions, who now, and we've now got a core group that are out there teaching the other faculty about how to diversify your curriculum. The courses are there, but how do you teach history? How do you teach psychology so that the students in the classroom see, the, see people in the, in the discipline who look like them, the scholars who look like them? And so we're seeing the faculty embrace that in a, um, in a much larger way and taking the initiative to make sure that their syllabus incorporates these, these concepts as they teach the class. You, you mentioned faculty development days. Can you talk to me about the frequency, how often they occur, when do they occur? Are they planned to be at the beginning or mid-year? And how uh, does each ca campus have the same number of faculty development days? It's a diff every campus handles things differently. At John Jay, we have faculty development day before the start of each semester. Before the semester starts. Each semester. So we'll have another one in January. We had one in August before the semester started, and we'll have another one in January um, where we, we have a range of topics, that, that and we have tracks that people can take. And so we have a track that, that throughout the day about different, if you're interested in having a more culturally relevant curriculum and experience for students, there's a whole track of things you can do that day. If you want to focus on mental health, there's a track for that throughout the day. Um, and I can say that CUNY has done some wonderful things in terms of preparing all of us to be more culturally sensitive. Last Friday, CUNY Central sponsored a conference on mental health with the Stephen Foundation, a Steve Foundation, on mental health for a diverse um, college campus and helping us understand how um, being um, black, Latinx, LGBTQ, um, disabled, how that impacts the experience of our students on campus and how to sensitize the campus to addressing those issues. And, and it was widely attended by people from academic affairs to student affairs. So CUNY is really taking a leadership in, in addressing the issues of the diversity of our campus and how do we equip the campuses to be successful, create successful experiences for our students. So these conferences are offered in addition to the faculty development days that occur on campuses? Correct. Mm -hmm. okay. Are there other opportunities, and how frequent are they? Because I wasn't aware that these were opportunities for faculty and students as well. Or this is just for faculty? Depends on what you're talking about. The Faculty Development Day, that's a John Jay specific concept. I don't know what other campuses do. Oh. That's what we do at John Jay. Where we oh, OK. Have how we, um, I don't know that other campuses do, but we're doing it. And what we've done is the faculty teach the classes and they come up with what they want. And so, for example, the one where we talked about diversifying the curriculum, they brought students into that, students they'd worked with, so students could talk about how their experience differed because the faculty members thought about that in the way they brought the curriculum together. So do we know if this is something that's campus uh, throughout the system or is it just particular campuses that have a faculty, a dedicated faculty development day? 
so I think every depart every campus has a center for teaching and learning, so that how they structure that might be different. So at Ostos, we have full days, but then we also have workshops throughout the semester, usually once a week, where faculty can attend. Um, we have a new faculty orientation as an onboarding for all new faculty, which is a year-long mandated program where they're meeting twice a month for three hours in order to really get acclimated with who our students are, but also the services that are on campus so that we make sure that they are able to connect students with what needs to happen. So with these objectives, are there any, any quantitative measures that are taken to uh, assess whether or not they achieve what the objective was, you know, do we have any quantitative data? So it's very challenging to um, assess the impact of how faculty have actually applied things in the classroom, so we try to then circle back and ask them, you know, out of what you've learned in that workshop, what have you now implemented going forward, but they're not, they're more <laughs> anecdotal than um, hard quantitative numbers. So we don't then really have a way to, uh, so it's self-reported. Professors themselves, the faculty themselves would determine how. Right, so we have student evaluations at the end of every semester where students evaluate the course and the instruction that they received in that course and we look at that and we actually put in a program a couple of years ago called the Ostos Teaching Institute where if we saw faculty were struggling um, and students were having you know some issues with the class, we we're asking faculty to attend a year-long workshop on um, pedagogy, right, and teaching and classroom management and inclusiveness. So as we're talking particularly about uh, inclusion and diversity, mm -hmm. is there a specific question on that survey that addresses that, that area? I'm sure, I'd have to go back and look, but I'm okay, sure. Okay, I would appreciate yes. mm -hmm. getting an answer mm -hmm. to that. Um, and then in uh, one other point, uh, how is CUNY, we talked a little about the, the, uh, the area of the under, I forget the term that they use. Underutilization. Underutilization, <laughs> that's the STEM areas, right? So how is CUNY diversifying the curriculum? We talked about hiring and trying to re uh, retain faculty in that area, but how are we diversifying the curriculum in those STEM areas. In addition to getting faculty that's diverse, how are we diversifying the curriculum? Are we talking about the greatness of African civilizations historically, you know, the science, the, the exactness of the pyramids? How are we diversifying that to have students be aware that it's, you know, there's some Africanness in it, and math should be something that's really easy because of the great history, if we can talk about that kind of progression. So that students know that there, there's historically evidence that there's capable examples of the greatness of Africans in the mm -hmm. STEM areas. Mm -hmm. So we require all of our courses to, besides assess what is needed for the actual discipline to also assess something related to our general education outcomes, one of those outcomes being diversity and inclusion. So they need to show that there are assignments specific to that and that there's learning happening in those areas. And then there's lots of extracurricular activities for the, um, right to this morning I was at our science day which is a three day event and really showing um, the diversity of scientists, um, women in the sciences and sharing our student successes of the number of students that we have, women engineers that we mm -hmm. now have moving on to senior colleges or on for doctoral programs. Okay, and I think wrapping up, the, fi the Flexible Common Core features six liberal arts and science courses and at least one course from each of the following five areas, world cultures and, glo and global issues, U.S. experience and diversity, creative expression, individual and society, and scientific world. How does CUNY ensure that every student, no matter the degree that they're pursuing, a major declare, major that they may have declared, engages in a diverse curriculum? So the way it's set out, the whole pathways with that, students have to take 30 credits and a specific number of credits in each one of those areas. So there's no way that you can graduate with a degree and not have experienced a course from those areas. 
Okay, so, but the required common core consists of four areas, 12 credits in the Associates of Arts, Associate of Science and Bachelor's Degree, and the English Composition courses, Mathematical and Quantitative Reasoning, Life and Physical Sciences. So how can we be sure that these required courses address the diverse perspectives and issues that we've talked about? Because they must take one course in U.S. Um, society and diverse, uh, individual and diverse uh, society in the U.S. experience and its diversity, they must take one course in that. They must take one course in the global um, world cultures and global issues, and then they have an extra three credits to go back and take a second course in one of those areas. So they still have to add one of those five courses in, in that. So, okay. so the required flex, the required core has how many course, how many credits are that? 30 credits, so 30 it's 10 and courses. 10 courses. And the flexible Common Core has how many credits? Well, it's it compl it's total. So the the top part, the English and math, mm -hmm. it is two courses in English, one course in math, one course in science. And then the flexible core, they must take one course in each of those mm -hmm. um, buckets, and then a second one in one of them. Okay. All right. One of those. Okay. Um, Oh, I want to uh, acknowledge we've been joined by Councilman Rodriguez. Would you have any questions? If you don't mind, I'd like to. Yes. I'd say something about this. First of all, I apologize for being late, but you know, this fight is a fight that will never stop. And when we address, you know, the challenges that we face about, you know, the need to bring diversity, you know, something that we cannot promise the presence of the future generation, even our son and daughter, that we will be able to fix it. Because when we, everything is a pipeline. So when we have a New York City that we invest $30 billion to educate 1.1 million students in the public school, and from there we recruit and it has an impact on the diversity that we have in the classroom in community college or senior colleges. So no doubt that we are facing today a crisis, a crisis that is only gonna be a matter of time. It's like the Me Too movement. It's like the NYCHA crisis. You know, people live and they have walked and they have passed through those buildings and they know, we have no, we've been witnesses of those situations of public housing. We have seen how women, you know, right, being violated for decades. But now we can say we cannot handle anymore. Especially the social media, you know, made an impact on being able to know what is going at the current time or in a situation. So the issue of diversity, for me, it started first with a pipeline. So when we have the most segregated education system in the nation, being our public school, where we invest $30 billion to educate 1.1 million students. And we have the public school of the rich and the public school of the poor. And then from the public school of the rich, we get the average and increase of a student that from elementary, middle, high school, they get ready to say, we have a high chance to get into Hunter, Brooklyn College, City College. The higher tier. So different from my year when I was at City College in the 80s, taking those classes with Professor Jeffrey, you know, organizing together in the 80s and the 90s. And you walk through City College, 80% of the students, they were black and Latino. Today, that number is on the early, in the 70s. So that's, you know, the issue of diversity for me is about unless we deal and we accept it, and we know that that's happening, we will not get into the trouble. So yeah, there's a lack of diversity we look in the curriculum. There's a lack of diversity of what are we teaching, you know, our, our youth. And I, as an immigrant that I am, I always say that, you know, it was recently that we got Bloomberg to corner in Sunny Street after Joano Juan Rodriguez, the first non-Native American who settled here in 1613 a free black man that was brought by the, from the island, from the island of Hispaniola. 
5,000 black Dominican came to Ellis Island in 1887. Those educational matters are not teach in the classroom. So we have issue what are we teaching? Is it still a European centered curriculum that we use? And even though, yes, I took some classes, and we have a great professor that they are committed and they go extra mile. But when we look about the test that we use in, the, in all those classes, requirement classes, they are not focused on the diversity of the city of New York. And I feel that even though we have made progress, we have to do much more. When it comes to the diversity, you know who are teaching those classes. This diversity is not there. From the hiring committee, those hiring committee, they don't have diversity. Because they, you know, unless we, you know, send the message from the top down. And I I love to see the new leadership at CUNY. I happy to see fellow being the chairman. I happy to see someone that was at Oslo Community College, was at LaGuardia, committed to work with us. But I feel that you know we as a city we need to demand more. You know, yet because we see some diversity representing here today, that's to know what we see in leadership at CUNY. The side that we have for the first time, you know, the chancellor and and two or three people being Latino as we are, you know, all that at some point Afro American good leadership position, it doesn't mean that the leadership of the institution who make decision, who made the hiring committee to decide who are provost, who are president, they reflect the diversity of our city. So I know that, you know, with the chairman here, you know, we have a voice advocating for this. I know that we can say, you know, we're happy to see the progress, but I just want to highlight it, that we need to de do much more, that this is a real crisis that we're dealing with when it comes to the diversity of what are we teaching with the diversity or who are the faces of people leading the departments and, and all the institutions. So with that, all I can say is adding my voice to let everyone know we, ha we cannot give up. And, and we need to push the, institu the institution because the challenges that we face is not a one individual thing. It's a cultural that we have to break to push institution. The leadership on curriculum and everything in the city of New York should reflect the diversity that we have today. And I end with this. In the 1900 census, the New York City population was 96% white. Only 2% were black. Latino and Asian were not counted. Today, population is 29% Latino, 27% Afro American, 17% Asian. Let's look for whatever we teach, for whoever our leaders in departments to reflect the diversity in New York City. We have to create pipeline. We are not building the strong pipeline. I hope that with the new leadership, we, are, we will be able to get close there, but you know, much more has to be done. I have faith with the chairman, I have faith with the leadership that he bring on board, but I know that also that he have inherited an institution that traditional has been left letting out black and Latino from leadership to opportunity. And again, today in 2019, especially to, those, to the youth, you know, most of the students, we lost population in the senior colleges. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Council Member. Just one last point. In your testimony, you didn't have a chance to read it into the testimony, but it is in testimony. You talk about the centers and institutes that operate in CUNY. You say that the campus, on page nine, the campus-based centers and university-wide institutes that organize extracurricular activities, and you identify a few of them, the Asian American Center at Queens College, Center for Puerto Rican Studies at Hunter College, the Center for Black Literature at Mecca Evers College, and a number of university-wide entities, such as the Mexican Studies Institute at Lehman College, and uh, the Institute for Research on the African Diaspora in the Americas and the Caribbean House at the Graduate Center. And you also note that there's a 500,000 grant from the council speaker to develop the Center for Ethnic, Racial, and Religious Understanding at Queens College. And there was recently a, uh, a memo that talked about that. I think it was announced yesterday that this is moving forward. And we're certainly excited about that, and we're looking forward to seeing what kind of concrete differences uh, we can expect 
now that we have these um, programs in place. But just briefly about the centers. What kind of funding formula is used for the centers that presently exist? There are, uh, there are close to, I may, there are more than 50, I'm sure, because I have a list of them, I didn't bring it. But what kind of funding formula is used in these uh, giving f money and funds to these centers? So it, um, the university is currently doing an inventory of all the centers and institutes and looking at the policies that have been in place to uh, create them in the first place and to uh, monitor their work over time. The funding based on the current policy um, was uh, meant that, that, that provided to new centers and institutes is meant to uh, get them off the ground. There's no clear formula. It depends on what the, um, <coughs> what the scope of the center or the institute is, what other uh, monies they bring to the table from uh, foundations and, and donors. And uh, when they go to the board of trustees, they go with sort of a financial plan for the first few years. Um, the, there are some of our centers and institutes that have been around for a longer time. Um, and those have, uh, over time, uh, been able to uh, generate uh, funds from the city and or the state, um, and some from uh, CUNY Central or the colleges that host them. Um, but that is uneven and it's on a case-by-case -case basis. So the work we're doing now is trying to take a look at the policy so that we can ensure that there's equitable access uh, to whatever resources are being provided by the university. Are they insured of dedicated space at each campus where no. they are? They're not? No. Okay. So is that going to be a part of what you look at also? Well, the, the, and so there may have to be a recertification process of centers and institutes because the, the, when they are approved, um, they must demonstrate that they have already secured um, funding for their operations and space for their operations. And so over time, what we have seen is that some centers have outgrown their initial uh, needs, and so that puts some pressure on the center and the campus and the university uh, to try to meet those needs so that they can continue to advance their mission. And then the flip of that is centers that, uh, and institutes that may have not uh, uh, continued to evolve uh, and, and, and grow, and so now they are occupying or, or utilizing resources uh, that may be made available to others. So that's part of the analysis that we're doing right now. And when do you expect to be able to have that uh, completed so that you might share that with us? So we're looking uh, at an internal timetable that would have us uh, take to the Board of Trustees some recommendations in the spring. Okay. All right. Well, I, I think that, that uh, most of the questions that I have that uh, I'm presenting to you, I do have to say that I'm very disappointed that you did not have the data that I asked for. Uh, because I had asked for it at a previous hearing, particularly regarding the postdoctoral fellowship program and the Diversity Projects Development Fund and the Faculty Fellowship Publication Program. Well, we did talk briefly about that one, yes. And uh, the Latino Faculty Initiative, because those are questions that I had asked previously. So I am disappointed that you weren't prepared with that information. And I do hope that we'll be able to get from you uh, the information that I requested, as well as the uh, data disaggregated so that I can look to see um, how we are moving it and look forward also to the new so-called master plan. Maybe we can get another <laughs> label for that. Uh, a n the new plan coming forward that shows some kind of evaluation of what previous plans have presented. But I do thank you for coming and uh, thank you so much and we'll call the next panel now. Thank you for the opportunity, thank and we you. will submit uh, the data as you have requested. Thank okay, you. Thank you. Do we have other student representatives? Perhaps we can. Oh, I think I think we'll probably put these two together. Yeah. That's a student. Okay, the next panel that we'll call is Dr. Anthony Brown from Hunter College, Department of Africana and Puerto Rican and Latino Studies, Dr. Brenda Green from Mega Evers College, and Professor James Blake from BMCC, Black Faculty.
thank you so much for coming and uh, offering testimony on this important topic. And you can start, we'll start with far left. And you can give us your name and present your testimony. Can you pull the mic a little closer? Okay. Is that better? Okay. Is that better now? That's better. Oh, okay. I hope everyone heard everything. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So founded in 2002, the Center for Black Literature was established to expand, broaden, and enrich the public's knowledge and aesthetic appreciation of the value of black literature through conferences, readings, workshops, and educational programs, and to ensure that the public is exposed to a broad range of black writers. The CUNY Association of Black Faculty and Staff was formed in October 2018, shortly after we presented at a hearing on blacks in higher education, black programs and black studies here at the council. Mm -hmm. And its mission is to support the academic and professional development of black faculty, staff, and students, as well as alumni across CUNY, and to serve as a resource for the retention recruitment, advancement, and growth of black faculty, staff, students, and alumni at CUNY. Journalist and scholar uh, Pamela Newkirk recently wrote a book on Diversity, Inc. and reminded us that the whole talk around diversity began in 1968 when President Johnson had legislation around civil rights and the Voting Act. Since 1968, the concept of diversity has been expanded to encompass other racial and ethnic minorities along with women, people with physical and mental disabilities, the LGBTQ community, and other marginalized populations. These groups have distinct characteristics and the plight of racial minorities in general and African Americans in particular have been overshadowed by the categories which in, within this widely used term of diversity. My remarks will focus on racial diversity with a particular emphasis on curriculum representing the disciplines within black studies programs. Those are the disciplines around literature, sociology, history, gender studies, and psychology. So the question is, do we have a way to gauge whether CUNY has a system in place to examine material, textbooks, discussions, et cetera, that promote diverse cultural experiences and backgrounds? So there are two areas that I'd like to refer to, um, black studies programs and pathways. Um, black studies programs and departments and black faculty play an important role in ensuring and serving the intellectual, academic, sociocultural, and professional needs of all students and in fulfilling the goals, vision, and mission of the City University of New York. The event of black studies strengthened democratic practices throughout the nation and democratized our academic institutions. However, given our current political climate and in an age when American democracy may be breathing its last breath, it's not surprising that black studies and black peoples in CUNY find themselves increasingly marginalized and discounted. This situation is extremely disturbing and problematic. How do we address this problem? It's well documented that students who enroll in black studies programs will have opportunities to take courses focused on the black experience. Furthermore, it's documented that there's a positive correlation between the number of faculty who teach in black studies programs and throughout academic departments in CUNY and the number of black studies courses that are created and taught. 
We must also support black studies degrees at CUNY. There are five senior colleges that currently offer black studies degrees in CUNY. This includes City College, Brooklyn, Hunter, York, and Lehman. Uh, John Jay College, Queens, New York City Tech, and Baruch offer black studies minors or concentrations, and the Graduate Center offers an Africana Studies track within the Masters of Liberal Arts Studies and a Certificate in Africana Studies. So one of the major reasons for the diminishing um, state of black studies programs in CUNY is the non-replacement non of black studies faculty. In the CUNY report on faculty diversity, black studies programs are included under the area of, area of, under the area of ethnic and cultural studies. By counting black studies as part of area ethnic and cultural studies, this report distorts the number of black studies programs and black faculty within CUNY. And even with the blurring of black studies, the number of black, study, black faculty in area ethnic and cultural studies decreased by 1.6% from 2010 to 2017. From 2010 to 2016, the number of black faculty hired was eight. In 2016 to 17, the number of black faculty in that one year hired was two across CUNY. So if we want curriculum that reflects diversity, we have to hire more black faculty. So I'm going to turn now to, the, to Pathways. Pathways has two components where we can look at how we diversify the curriculum. One is the flexible core and pathways, and one is the college option. The flexible core requires that students um, take courses in the areas of world cultures and global issues, US experience in diversity, creative expression, individual and society, and the scientific world. So the, the buckets of world cultures and issues and US experience in diversity are natural places in which to hold, um, to have curriculum representing um, black studies or representing racial, racial uh, groups. So what I did was just to look on the college's websites about what kinds of courses were offered in their flexible core. And it was very uneven. Um, a review of the courses on the website looks, appears that um, those courses, those colleges that have uh, more black faculty, black and Latino faculty, seem to have a number, a higher number of courses focused on racial diversity. And that goes in hand with what I said. If you have faculty who represent racial diversity, you will have more courses created. I saw that in LaGuardia Community College, uh, BMCC, and Lehman. They seem to have a higher number of courses. Now, this is just looking at the website. Additionally, uh, courses have the college option. That's not in your report, but the college option gives colleges an opportunity to create other required courses. They have to have um, a combination of n another nine courses in the college option. At Meg Rivers College, we used, um, as part of our college option, the concept of a social cultural diversity cluster. So all students must take at least um, three credits in the sociocultural diversity, and then another six credits in the, in the, as part of the college option in integrative um, discipline. So the sociocultural diversity cluster becomes another way where you can offer courses um, that are racially diverse. So what are our challenges, our current challenges? Current challenges is that although nearly 25% of students in CUNY are black, the institutional support for programs reflecting black studies has been reduced over the last three years. Colleges have failed to replace faculty who have retired or resigned, thereby affecting program growth and the number of black studies majors. In some colleges, there are no full-time or part-time faculty directly connected to the black studies programs. There's a high attrition rate for directors of co or coordinators of black studies program. And in one college, there have been five coordinators of black studies in 10 years. The administration tends to cancel upper level black studies courses because of um, thus eliminating courses needed for the major and affecting retention in the program. Solutions. Without vigilance and deliberate strategies, we will roll back and represent 
social worlds that, ra that lack racial diversity. We must change the culture and address what Pamela Newkirk calls in her books the, the cancer of the culture around racial diversity. We must ask whether there really is a will to address diversity. We've been at this for a number of years and we're still talking about it. Black studies must be respected and supported within the confines of CUNY. And we must be sensitive to exploring creative ways to co offer components of black studies. So for example, at Meg Rivers College, we developed an AA degree in Africana diasporic literature. And we have a BA degree in the pipeline waiting to get approved by the college body on African diasporic literature. That is not the same as black studies, but it's a component. Students enroll in black studies courses when they're offered and these courses must be supported within degree programs and with full-time faculty. Colleges must utilize deliberate strategies that support and retain black studies programs and faculty. Colleges must use their websites to promote courses that reflect racial diversity. You have more students who are now um, doing e-permit. They go to other colleges to see what courses they can take. They should be able to see those courses reflected on the website. And I saw very few courses. Um, CUNY offers no master's degree in Africana or black studies. It's amazing that this, there still is no master's degree at a place called CUNY, the City University of New York, in Africana or black studies. Um, the, the Graduate Center should develop a black studies master's program that's in concert with the foundation of black studies as a discipline and reflective of a broad range of thinkers across disciplines. Data on black studies programs and black faculty hires with respect to status and college need to be documented. It should not be grouped under area studies. And finally, we need to look at the whole concept of liberal arts degrees. Black studies programs often fall, fall under the liberal arts. In the broadest sense, liberal arts is a, pr uh, the liberal arts support learning that involves diverse coursework so students can develop a range of knowledge. The data show that this, the skills they develop in the liberal arts are applicable to any job. So liberal arts graduates enter a range of fields. There's a, been a focus on STEM. We need to focus on the liberal arts and not tie degree programs and um, course curriculum to courses that's that are technical or skill-based that we, um, we'll, where we say that they will have their job. Thank you. <coughs> Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Anthony Brown. I'm the chair of the Department of Africana and Puerto Rican Latino Studies at Hunter College, as well as the chair of the CUNY Association of Black Faculty and Staff. I thank Councilwoman Barron and her staff for the opportunity to present today. Research shows that students and faculty benefit from a diverse curriculum. Diversity in the curriculum enhances critical thinking by raising new issues and perspectives, by broadening the variety of experiences shared, by confronting stereotypes on issues of race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, and class, among others. It exposes students to different perspectives by allowing a broader variety of experiences. The curriculum itself communicates important messages about the importance of diversity or, or the lack thereof. On the first day of classes, when a student browses the syllabi created by their professors, do they see readings that reflect their experiences? The key question is what qualities does the university want their graduates to have? If one of them is to prepare students to thrive in a diverse democracy, then a diverse curriculum is essential. Diversity requirements are a common method utilized by universities to ensure that graduates have knowledge and competencies in this area. Hunter College, where I teach, requires four courses that would satisfy its pluralism and diversity requirement. They are one, non-European societies, particularly those of Africa, Asia, Latin America, or those indigenous to the Americas. Two, one or more of the following groups in the US, 
African Americans, Asian Americans, Latino Americans, and Native Americans. Three, women and or issues of gender or sexual orientation. Four, Europe including ways in which pluralism and diversity have been addressed. In addition, CUNY instituted pathways requirements for graduation in the flexible common core where students are required to take six courses in the following areas. World cultures and global issues, US experience and its diversity, creative expression, individual and society, and the scientific world. However, course offerings across the university tend to be uneven, reflecting in part the power and influence of administrators and departments. In order to develop racial literacy, we need a base of knowledge. For instance, students should understand the historical processes of inclusion, exclusion, and subjugation of African Americans. They should know the history of black activism for civil and human rights. In an era, in an era rather, where facts are questioned, our classrooms play a vital role in alleviating misconceptions around race. Helping students, for example, learn about inequalities, as well as policies to reduce disparities in wealth, education, policing, health, public policy, and debt. We know that when students are only exposed to dominant perspectives, they come to believe that viewpoints from other racial or ethnic groups are insignificant and lack value, intellectual worth, and scholarly credibility. Ways to promote a diverse curriculum. The recruitment of a diverse faculty arguably is the most effective method in diversifying the curriculum at CUNY. Recruitment of black faculty can be a challenge, particularly in departments with an uneven history of tenured black faculty. A strategy that has been successfully utilized by both public and private universities to address faculty diversity is cluster hiring. A cluster hire would involve hiring a critical mass of black faculty members based on shared interdisciplinary research interest. These hires could be in a single department or a cross-disciplinary research area that would provide the new hires with a community of scholars that, reduce, that would reduce feelings of isolation and marginalization. At the same time, these scholars would utilize their interdisciplinary training to diversify the curriculum and learning experiences uh, through theories, methods, readings, and pedagogical approaches. For CUNY, building on the university's research, teaching, demographics, and location, a cluster hire initiative would enhance the university's existing research capacity, contribute to new discoveries and applications of knowledge, and address real world problem problems that require cross-disciplinary expertise. For example, a cluster hire centered in Africana studies around the theme of black futures would attract black faculty whose teaching and research focuses on challenges facing urban areas that might include race and social justice, educational and or health disparities, urban housing, poverty, policing, and any other topic that speaks to persistent concerns facing New Yorkers. Research would be coordinating through a Black Futures CUNY-wide disciplinary group that would coordinate research, funding, cross-disciplinary collaborations, and the dissemination of research. Teaching and learning centers. Several CUNY campuses have some variation of teaching centers that allow faculty to share and discuss practices that can be incorporated into their teaching and research. These centers conduct seminars on diversity, inclusion, and pedagogy that allow faculty to reflect on their current approaches and learn new ones. More often than not, faculty members have not been trained to seek out and infuse diverse readings and pedagogical approaches in their courses. These centers would allow faculty to critically examine their classroom practices um, and assign course materials. Faculty cannot depend exclusively on the material they learned uh, while they were in graduate school. Instead, they must hold themselves accountable 
for introducing new literature to which they may be unaccustomed in order to enable students to understand differences. More specifically, by engaging in collaborative peer review, faculty can receive feedback on the readings and other materials they select for their courses. This practice can enable faculty to identify diverse literatures, build on the expertise and knowledge of their colleagues, thus enhancing their own knowledge. In closing, faculty must be, intention, must be intentional in incorporating cultural inclusion into their pedagogy and new courses. Diversity, learning, and engagement are cyclical and largely dependent upon accountability, collaboration, and multicultural consciousness among faculty. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. I am uh, really thankful for being here today, uh, Councilman Barron. I have to say that every time I've come to one of these meetings, I've learned a lot about CUNY, not just BMCC, but the questions that you've asked and the answers that, you, some of the answers that you've gotten uh, is illuminating. It really gives me an understanding of what's happening CUNY-wide. So it's an honor to be here and I thank you for having this hearing. I'm here with a little heavy heart today and before I get into my testimony, I just want to say that uh, on my way over here, I was trying to get the status of uh, a study abroad program to Africa. And I thought that was something that I really uh, thought was really important given that this is the uh, 400 year anniversary of the enslavement of Africans in America. And I thought about being in Africa and touring the slave castle and lo looking at that, what they call the door of no return, that it would have been great to have our students visit the west coast of Africa and return because we were never as descendants of these slaves supposed to return to Africa. I found out that there is no black studies program or study abroad program to Africa. There's not one coming up in the, in the summer and there wasn't one in the spring. And when I began to uh, ask why, I was told that the study abroad committee made the decision that they would be going to Spain and Mexico and France and uh, one, one other country I can't, that doesn't come to mind, but not Africa. So they didn't have enough money. China, that's where they're going. So they went to China last year and they're going back to China this year, but nothing in terms of Africa. And that tells me about the mindset of people in CUNY, faculty in CUNY. So in my testimony, I decided that I would outline the power centers that exist within the city university that makes the determination as to what happens in terms of programs, curriculum, hiring, promotion, sabbaticals, et cetera. So I start with the chairpersons of each academic department, which is the head of that particular department. The chairpersons have a personnel and budget committee that they chair. And the personnel and budget committee makes the decisions as to who gets hired, who gets promoted, who gets tenure, who gets sabbaticals, et cetera. And they make recommendations to a college-wide person, person, uh, personnel committee who then makes recommendations to the president or the provost who makes it to the president and then to the Board of Trustees. Now here's where the problem is. At BMCC, I would say 80% of the people in these committees are white faculty, 80%. Might be even higher in other departments because a lot of the departments have no black faculty members. So people who are making these decisions are making these decisions to hire people, to have programs like uh, study abroad to Africa from a very Eurocentric perspective. And it shows very little uh, understanding and sensitivity or desire, in my, as far as I'm concerned, to really relate 
to people of color. So you have your, your chairpersons, you have your personnel and budget committees, and you have what you call the academic senate. The chairpersons meet with the personnel and budget committees of the department, they make recommendations to the college-wide uh, committee, which consists of all the chairpersons, and then that makes, they make uh, recommendations to the president. Again, 80% of them and more are white. Uh, when you don't have black faculty, you have no power because you're not sitting at the table. And the only way you can sit at the table is you've got to be hired and you've got to be full time. Then you can have a vote and a voice. But if you're not hired, you don't have a vote and you don't have a voice. Only those people who are hired have the voice, voice, vote and the voice. And those are white faculty members for the most part. So we are excluded, not only from positions, but we are also excluded from wealth. Because the money that comes in to pay the salaries of people who are hired comes from tax dollars. So the university is supported by tax dollars. So the higher you get hired, you get paid, you get promoted, you get paid, you get tenure, you get paid, you become a recipient of the wealth that exists through, that you get through your salaries, et cetera. Black faculty members are excluded from all of that. If we do get in the cent in, into the uh, uh, university, we're generally at the lower levels of management. We're generally at the lower levels of faculty appointments. We're generally around the level of lecturer or assistant professor, et cetera, which is less money than a tenured professor or somebody you know, who, 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 who is on sabbatical or, or whatever. The point I'm making is that the university plays this game of diversity and expansion of diversity. But when you really look at it, there was a Chronicle of Higher Education article that came out and said BMCC is the most diverse campus um, in, among management in the nation. And the interim president asked everybody to clap on it. So I went and said, wait a minute, am, am I blind? I'm looking around, <laughs> you know? We're the most diverse in management in the country. And what I found out is this. We might be. But what they forgot to say, they didn't break it to top management, middle management, lower management. Now, we might be very diverse, but not at the top. No way. If you just go to the website at BMCC and just look at the college uh, president's cabinet, 80% of them are white. Then you look at what's happening in the lower levels, uh, directors or assistant directors, uh, you know, et cetera, they're mostly black. So yeah, we're diverse, but the distribution of wealth is going to the top. It's not filtering down to the, to the bottom. So anyway, I just wanted to point out that until we deal with the structure, the power centers in the university, you know, that's the faculty who makes the decisions as to what courses are offered, what courses will not be offered, what, uh, who will get uh, hired, who will not get hired. That comes from the academic, from the faculty. That comes from the faculty, the chairpersons, the, the, et cetera. As long as that is no diversity there, we're not gonna look for a lot of black folks. Let's just say you frankly, I've been here 48 years. I'm not, I know what I'm talking about, okay? I've seen black people come and and, and not be replaced. And they're waiting for me to retire. <laughs> Seriously. And when I retire, they won't, they're not gonna replace Blake again with somebody that looks like me. So if you look at BMCC, I'm sure it must be happening in other schools. As we retire, we are not replaced by people of color. There's, we're, we're a small number in the beginning. And as we retire, we become even smaller. Okay? And, it, and, and it's going to take a lot more than talk to correct this. So I have some suggestions that I put in my testimony, okay? Of course we have to hire more full-time black and Latino faculty. And that has to be a, a, a commitment other than words. It's, it's year after year and uh, we talk about hiring more black and Latino faculty and it's just not happening. Or it's happening in such a small pace that is really not happening. You know, you, somebody said to me, oh, Blake, you should be happy, man. 
in the science department, they just hired a black person. I said, oh, yeah, how many uh, full-time people you have? Oh, about 50-something. Well, you, you just hired one, so I should be happy? That's the mindset that people have, you know? And they said, we're making progress because we hired one or we, we hired two. The president should review the hiring practices. The college president should review the hiring practices of each academic department and reject candidates for positions uh, in that department, in departments with a history of not hiring black and Latino faculty. CUNY Central should reject candidates for appointment from, from those colleges because if those from the president, then it goes to the Board of Trustees. And the Board of Trustees could step in and say, you know, look, no, no, no. L go back, let's look at the history of the hiring in your particular college, in your particular uh, uh, department, and reject those things. College presidents should be evaluated. <coughs> they should be part of their evaluation, should be how they uh, deal with improving faculty diversity in the college and in the administration in their respective college. It should be evaluated. That should be a, something in their evaluation because people respond to things that they're going to be evaluated on. That's right. You know, and because what you're being evaluated on is important for your growth and your development professionally. So if the CUNY says diversity is important, then make that one of the criteria for evaluation of a college president. And that every, every, everybody uh, in the college, from the administration to the staff, et cetera, should be taking courses in sensitivity training and dealing with cultural uh, uh, awareness and competency. You know, we send out information that everybody must take this test on sexual uh, misconduct, you know, because it's an important issue. Well, everybody needs to take the test and go through some motions about learning about cultural sensitivity, because that's also extremely important issue, so that should be there too. And finally, uh, the, uh, that every, every student before they graduate from either senior college or community college should be mandated to take a course in black studies. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your testimony. And I've got lots of questions before we move on to the next panel. But I'm particularly uh, concerned about the addendum that you have to your testimony mm -hmm. from a student yes. who indicates that the class was given an assignment to uh, to write up to portray themselves as Muslims, an assignment given to non-Muslim students to portray themselves as Muslims. And the student here in this document indicates that uh, Many of the customs and symbols were ridiculed and uh, referred to replacing the hijab with a hoodie. And the jokes were made about Islam, and they pretended that Muslims drink alcohol and use liquor bottles, and just that it was very offensive. And that when they presented it to the instructor, uh, well, I think the instructor said that she dismissed my concerns and did not correct the students but appeared to approve their behavior. The student complained to the diversity office and the vice president of student affairs and the college president and the vice president of student affairs and the chairperson of the English department. This is what I'm looking at here. Mm -hmm. They all dismissed my concerns and told me that what happened was for, quote, educational purposes. I find that alarming, disturbing, and unacceptable. I really do. And the student says, I know there's freedom of speech, but it should not include discrimination and hate against students uh, regarding their religion. So was this a topic? Was this matter discussed? Well, actually, what happened was that this, you're reading something that was entered into the minutes of the Academic Senate in October of, of uh, 2017. That's when it occurred. And when the student went before, came to me and told me what happened, and we felt that we needed to have a, a something that deals with Islamophobia uh, in the college, and that one of the uh, committees that deal with that is the Academic Senate. And so we brought it before the Academic Senate, 
actually what happened is I tried to bring it before the academic senate and I was shut down. I kept trying to bring it down and I was shut down. No, it's not something that can be discussed in the academic senate. You know, this is something that belongs in another forum, et cetera. But the student and I continue to go to the senate to uh, ask them to address the issue. And finally, after almost a year or more, the senate did decided that they would take up the issue. Uh, but it just shows you how, oh, what happened is this. They said that this was not an issue for the academic senate. This was the faculty, majority white faculty of the academic senate said this is not an issue for the academic senate. And we went away for a holiday and we came back and we found out that there was a workshop being held uh, in one of the theaters that was being sponsored by the Academic Senate and it was dealing with sexual harassment. So my question to the Senate was, how could you have a workshop on sexual ha harassment that didn't go through the Academic Senate? Well, we've been trying to get Islamophobia through this Academic Senate. How did you do that? And the, question, the, the response I got from the chairperson was, uh, we just felt it was more important, okay? And uh, of course, you know, we had to do what we had to do, but we got them to, we got their attention because it was, it, 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 the mindset, you know, the disconnect is so wide, you know, in terms of the racial disconnect that people just didn't see or understand why was Professor Blake so upset, you know? Why was it, I'm a Muslim, first of all, you know? You know, I would be, a, you know, anybody would be upset if they made, you know, mockery of your religion, but they couldn't understand that. You know, and why was I standing with the student? They couldn't understand that. Well, why is the student? So finally, the student requested that his statement be put in the minutes okay. of the academic senate. So I mean, I I'm reading what it says that it was brought to the vice president of student affairs. It says the college president, and I'm sure that there is another opportunity for me to find out what the persons that are indicated here as having been presented with this issue to give me their, uh, their opinion, their aside, their, their understanding of what happened. So I'm always, I've, always, I've learned, you know, there's always another perspective. So I would love to uh, follow up on this and find out in that regard what's happened. But I have lots of questions in general for the panel about the testimony that you did present. Um, can you clarify for me college option you said the college option has nine credits. Does every college have this opportunity yeah. for nine credits? Yeah, this is part of Pathways. Right. So Pathways, part of Pathways. you have the Common Core. You have Common. And then you have the Flexible Core, right. which is, um, the Flexible Core is 18 credits, I believe, and then the college option is nine credits. Okay. And so every, all students have to take um, courses in those levels. Right. College, the college option, colleges have an opportunity to decide how they want to have courses distributed in the college option. Okay. But so how many credits are the required Common Core? 30 credits. And within those 30 credits, it's 18 credits for flexible and nine credits for optional, op college option? No, that's no. no. It's it's thirty credits for the Common Core. Help me here, right? It's thirty okay. credits for the Common because Core. Because in my what I heard the uh, panel before say was that it was thirty credits of ten courses each, but that it included courses from the flexible Common Core. Okay, so that's my question. The college, the college, each college can decide whether or not. They want to have nine credits? No, each college has to have the college option. They can decide how those credits are distributed. Each college must have the college option yes. of nine credits. Right. I don't think the college option was mentioned in the previous discussion. It wasn't, discussion. so that's discussion. why I'm Right, so the college option, um, so within our college option, we included, um, you have to take three, we included another bucket, sociocultural diversity. So every student has to take uh, one course in sociocultural diversity. And then the second part of the college option would be integrative knowledge. So they have to take two courses 
uh, six credits in, in an area that combines two disciplines. So the, when going back to the diversity issue, mm -hmm. the diversity issue is very clear in the flexible core because you can do the U U.S. and diversity or mm -hmm. you can do world cultures. However, my review of how those courses are uh, created within the flexible core is uh, um, varies across colleges. Some, some like I... I think it's at Lehman, they had a lot of courses that focused on Latino and Asian American and, and black, whereas other colleges, they use diversity in a much broader way. Mm -hmm. So, um, and just let me add this, that courses that are in the flexible core have to be approved by pathways. There's a, a pathways committee that approves the courses. And there are certain criteria and guidelines that colleges have to follow. However, they're broad enough so that if you can, you, your U.S. Um, diversity can be, um, it doesn't have to deal with racial diversity. Mm -hmm. It can be the, um, just thinking, trying to think of, of um, just United States, U.S. world history, U.S. United States history. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you can say that in United States history within that course, they're going to address different racial groups, different um, ethnic groups, and so that it, it ends up meeting the criteria of the flexible core, but it's really not specific enough. A course that would be more specific enough if you had in the flexible core African-American history could conceivably be, be part of the um, flexible core if a college chose to do that. But ver I don't see that colleges are really using the flexible core to promote racial diversity as much as it could be promoted. So that, that's a, another way of really zeroing in and promoting racial diversity. I hope that's yes. made it clearer. That, that's clear. Um, in terms of the, okay, I can't hear. Um, in terms of the fact that this is the 400th year since 1619, because certainly we've been here longer than 400 years. That's talking about enslavement, but we were here before Columbus. For those of you who might be interested in reading the book, it's entitled, They Came Before Columbus, and it's Dr. Ivan Van Sertima, which was very enlightening. But in terms of acknowledging uh, this great time, how are study abroad trips authorized? Who does that? They come through the uh, study study abroad committee. That's of the college. that's central or at each college or at BMCC we have a study abroad committee. I'm not sure what happens in other schools, um, and the committee is elected by members of the academic senate, uh, and they deliberate on proposals that are made to them for study abroad programs, and then they vote on it. So at your institution, it's the committee at that school that decides where they're going to go? Right. And is it generally one trip, No. It's, one location? No, it's, it's several. Oh, several. Uh, it's China. Okay. It's uh, Mexico. Within, this, within one academic year, there are several? During the summer. During the summer. Oh, during the during summer. During the summer months. And uh, last year they went to Brazil, they went to China, they went to Mexico, and Spain. Uh, this year they're going to uh, Mexico, China, and when I asked about the other countries, I was told I couldn't, they didn't want to tell me, they said, look, we're going to make an announcement next week, and I wanted to know why, because I wanted a student who's asking about Africa. So how do, Students submit proposals, does faculty submit proposals? How are these uh, selections reviewed? Is it a proposal, is there a process, is there an outline? How, the how proposals is Proposals are submitted by faculty from by various fa departments. Like by the faculty modern, from, yeah, okay. The modern language department, for example, might submit a proposal for study abroad program to Spain. Uh, the, the Center for uh, Ethnic Studies uh, submitted a, pro a proposal called the Black Experience in Africa. So different departments submit different proposals. So there was committee. a proposal that was submitted 
Uh, there was a proposal uh, pr uh, uh, submitted by the Center for Ethnic Studies called the Black Experience in Africa. Okay. And it was turned down. Okay. Can I just um, add that I think it really, it really varies across colleges. I mean, it, we don't even have a committee. It seems like really at our co at Maker Rivers College, we have a study abroad director, and um, faculty can submit proposals. But the criteria for which proposals will be supported, um, which students will get scholarships, it seems to be dependent on factors that are not le not clearly defined and that are not transparent. So there's no that's that's what I'm trying to get at. There's What's no the transparency. Process, you know? Yeah, we don't have. It's not a transparent process. Um, at our college. There's no criteria listed for how it will be evaluated? How it or will be, no, this, no. It's, I know that faculty can submit proposals. We had one faculty member at our college who decided to raise um, $20,000 and take students. He raised the money and took students to South Africa because he wasn't, didn't feel like he was really getting support. So that, that person did that independent? Yes. Of, oh. I thought that was college supported and no, it was not college supported. So where does the money come from, Dr. Blake? Where, where does the money come from? Is there a yeah. budget line? Yes, there is. The oh, money okay. comes from the BMCC Association, which is the uh, fiscal body that governs the student activity fee that each BMCC students student pays. Uh, so every year, monies are allocated to the study abroad program mm. from the student activity fee. So in, in reality, the students are paying for it because it's coming out of their student activity fee. Is that the same thing at Medgar? It comes out of the student activity fee, but again, there's, there's a lack of transparency with respect to really what, how much money is there and um, there are some students who might get they st who might apply for scholarships from other sources. Mm -hmm. There used to be a stock. I don't know if that's still available. The CUNY used to have a fund where they would support or supplement the the funding for students who were doing study abroad programs. But really, if the colleges are not really raising enough money and the student activity fees, because they cannot support uh, most students, most of our students are working students and. You know, they do many mm -hmm. things to try and raise money. So right. if the college is really not supporting it, they have to go to other funds, and then s colleges go to um, the funding that they raise in discretionary accounts as part to supplement the student activity fee. Okay. Dr. Brown, in your testimony, you talked about uh, teaching and learning centers, and the centers conduct seminars on diversity, inclusion, and pedagogy, that allow faculty to reflect on the current approaches. So not every campus has a teaching and learning center. Uh, it's my understanding, no. Uh, several do, and they've become quite popular over the last decade or so, um, largely because uh, we've recognized that faculty need to upgrade their skills, their pedagogy, and so this becomes a space whereby they can come together as peers and engage in that process. And there's been good data showing the outcomes nationally for faculty who undergo uh, a process such as this. How would this compare to the conferences and the faculty development days that were referenced in the first panel? Do you have any idea yeah, how? I'm not sure about the faculty development days. Uh, I know at professional associations, um, there are often workshops uh, for members on developments in the discipline, uh, best practices, et cetera. And so colleges serve, the, the conferences rather serve as a site whereby faculty can engage uh, in a very didactic process that they can then bring back to their students. Does Hunter have a teaching and learning center? Yes, we do, okay. we do, yes. And uh, who, who heads that up? Um, who's in charge of that? Uh, there are several faculty members um, from various departments who are in the leadership uh, it's called a CERT at Hunter. I don't recall exactly what the acronym stands for. A but CERT? A-C-E-R-T, yes. Uh, but they have done a number of workshops. Um, I have a faculty member who's currently a fellow with a CERT uh, from Africana Studies. And he actually just put on, uh, about three weeks ago, a fabulous panel um, 
encompassing faculty from other campuses looking at Africana studies um, and developments in the discipline, uh, and it was well received, I attended it. Uh, so there have been you know, several initiatives such as that around issues of diversity, inc also increasing the technological capacity of faculty, mm. et cetera. So the teaching and learning centers engage in a, a broad array of practices designed to enhance faculty and by extension, the experience of learning uh, for students in, in our classrooms. You mentioned technology, mm -hmm. and I'm glad you did. Is there a way that we can look at how we can incorporate much of, uh, might be readily accessible through uh, the World Wide Web that in fact supports what we want to achieve? Is there a way, have we talked about that? Is there a way to do that that would uh, be able to be monitored or controlled or utilized by campuses, particularly in terms of mm -hmm. getting faculty to mm -hmm. change. Because remember, we're talking about the faculties, they're, they're the ones that are in the cl classrooms and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. controlling what goes on and designing the curricula. There, there's so many, given the advances in technology we've seen just in the last decade, I would say, uh, there's so many um, innovative uh, technologies that are becoming available. Um, Certainly, um, you know, Blackboard now is pretty widely used, but there's um, faculty who have created um, YouTube uh, mm. channels, if you will, oh, okay. that outline courses. Uh, uh, there's so many um, um, <coughs> uh, websites, et cetera, dedicated to various topics. Uh, there are podcasts uh, that have become available that are done by and for faculty that certainly um, um, touch on course material relevant to students that are now become very pervasive that we also incorporate in the classroom. There are technologies like clickers and other things that we can get instant responses from students. And so um, speaking for my campus, uh, all these technologies are available, uh, encouraging and incentivizing faculty to take advantage of it, particularly given our current generation of students right. have grown up in a digital age to make sure mm -hmm. that we are not teaching in a 20th century fashion right. for 21st century students. Mm -hmm. So that's something I, I'm very cognizant of and, and we are pushing and strongly encouraging our faculty to remain technologically relevant so we Definitely. can connect with our students uh, for the new age. So we've just gotten a message that the, which school? BMI. Okay, so it's across the campuses. The BMI has a program, a project, uh, but this, they're going to one particular place in Africa and they think it's a lack of funding. So we'll look into this and see uh, what, what more can be done. I can, if I could just add briefly, um, uh, my department um, is, finalizing the process of a study abroad to Puerto Rico. Uh, mm -hmm. And we have had students uh, previously who have gone to Africa through um, Brooklyn College and also uh, gone to Cuba uh, through Baruch um, a few years ago. So um, certainly we need to augment and develop uh, additional study abroad opportunities. Uh, we, our department also is in the process of thinking about South Africa and Ghana as part of our study abroad ex experience. Would that be open to students from other campuses or would it be restricted to your particular it, campus? It, it can be open to students from other campuses. The, particularly the study abroad Cuba I referenced earlier, mm. our students went with a faculty member uh, from Baruch who had organized that particular trip. Uh, and so students, yes, do are able to go across campuses and participate oh. in these study abroad opportunities. Okay, uh, Professor Blake, in your testimony, one of your suggestions said that, uh, can't find it, something to the effect, oh, here it is, that central staff should reject candidates for appointment from those colleges that have a poor record of hiring black and Latino faculty. Yes. And I had asked, um, I had asked if there were other kinds of incentives that CUNY could institute that would make it more attractive to hire blacks. And I just wanted to put into the record that 
CUNY, uh, SUNY, I'm sorry, SUNY Chancellor, I had a meeting with her, and they have a program at SUNY which is called PRODIGY, P-R-O-D-I hyphen G, and it stands for Promoting Recruitment, Opportunity, Diversity, Inclusion, and Growth at SUNY campuses. And what they are doing is that they are in fact giving financial mm -hmm. incentives mm -hmm. to those college campuses that have demonstrated hiring a black and Latino and uh, faculty to be on their campus. So they understand that this to me is something that's concrete. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're looking, this is what we want to do, and as you do it, we will underwrite the cost of that person. I think it's two or three years, and then we're going to uh, expect you to continue to do that. But I think that certainly we've got to do more than talk and set goals. We've got to have something concrete that would in fact um, get to where we said we want to do. Right. And I do wanted to ask, I did want to ask you, have you, has the organization had an opportunity to meet with the chancellor? No, we haven't. No. Have you? We've gotten no response. Okay, you haven't gotten a response. Well, I certainly will uh, look to see how I can support that meeting happening so that he can hear directly from the body what their concerns are, especially as we know that this is such an important topic to him. We always talk about making sure the people who are most directly affected are at the planning, the strategy, the thinking processes to make sure that we don't get something that does not reflect what we know has been effective in our interaction. So I certainly will reach out to let him know that you are looking for a meeting and in any way that I could facilitate that happening. Uh, certainly now that we are televising it, he, he knows that that's something that's important to me to make sure that we can get that moving and get it on the table. As we talk about all of these things we want to do, I think it would be important for this body to be a part of designing that strategic framework, which they call their master plan, mm -hmm. or master whatever they call it, to make sure that he hears directly from the people who are most intim intimately involved in making sure that we have those kinds of advances. So I do want to thank you for your testimony. Um, yeah, I just, can I just add this? I've just looked. I was oh, just, just one other thing. Cluster hiring. Mm -hmm. how, how does that work? Uh, essentially, the university uh, commits itself uh, to hiring a critical mass, in this case, of black faculty uh, across various disciplines. Um, by doing so, you create a built-in community of support. So as Professor Blake mentioned, you're not hiring one person who is mm -hmm. part of 50 you know, and feeling alienated. And, and so this cluster essentially comes in together. Uh, they you know, have various initiatives that allow them to support each other as they go through the tenure promotion process at the college. Uh, uh, or where mm -hmm. has it worked and how successful has it been? Uh, Cornell is an example that comes to mind, I okay. want to say about four years ago, I think they hired at least six black faculty. That's not many. Uh, That's well, not that, many. that was a little unprecedented for the university. But I, I mean, but that uh -huh. the fact that six is, yeah. you know, wow, we got six. That was, yeah, but this is the nature of higher ed. Uh, yeah. And that was, in many ways, uh, close to unprecedented wow. uh, in terms of uh, particularly Ivy League schools, yes. Mm -hmm. I think Vanderbilt did, did that a little while Plus ago. to higher, or do you know how many? I don't know how many. Okay. Mm -hmm. But I, I think that that's important mm -hmm. so that, again, it's not isolated, it's not individuals. Yeah. And I would imagine they would stay together as a cohort, yes. meet together, ex uh, concerns that they have, they would share Absolutely. them. And Absolutely, yeah, yes. And that's, that's the idea of, of doing that because the alienation and then mm -hmm. issues of retention mm -hmm. become a major challenge when it becomes one individual. Uh, in many cases, that one individual may be the first in the history of that department being hired. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine the stress and the pressure right. of trying to navigate the academy uh, from that vantage point. Right. That's great. I hope that when we get to have, when you get to have the meeting with the chancellor, you can share yeah. that with him Absolutely. so yes. that he can have that as consideration. Um, Excuse me. I just wanted yes, to, on the, for Dr. the record, Green. just to go back to the whole flexible core. So Christian, the, is your mic the com okay. Is that's this it's on? on. Yeah. Okay. So the common core is thirty credits, uh -huh. and twelve credits of those are. The, the math and science 
And then the 18 credits is the flexible course. So the common core consists of basic core courses and then the flexible core. And then the college option is 12 credits. So it's three credits. We, we have two buckets in our college option. So the college option is 12 credits. So we've divided our college option into two parts, the integrative knowledge cluster and the sociocultural cluster. So you have 30 plus 12 which is 42 for Pathways. So f Pathways is 42 areas that's designated. Right. Oh, okay. Okay. That's good. Okay. Uh, any other parts that you want to share? Okay. Just thank you so much yes. for coming and giving your testimony. Thank and you thank so you much. For your and, uh, leadership let me know when you're having your next meetings. You know, I've had conflicts, yes. but I certainly want to continue we'll to be involved. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. And our final panel is going to be called, uh, we have Jamel Henderson from CUNY Rising Alliance, who is coordinator for that program, and Sabina Dorville uh, from Student Government at CCNY. Oh, have they submitted slips? Okay, you're going to be joined by two others as they complete the slips. Thank you. Just a brief pause so the panel can start all together. The two ad additional panelists are Gugita Chitram and Enrica Oropeta. If I've mispronounced your names, when you pronounce them, I'll get it right. Thank you so much. We'll start on my far left, on, on the far left of the panel. Hi, can you hear me? Hello? Hi there. Um, good afternoon, um, Chairperson, um, Chairman. Woman, Marn. My name is Jigita Chaitram. Mm -hmm. It's okay. <laughs> it happens a lot. Um, Pull the mic a little closer. Okay. My name is Jigita Chaitram. I'm a student leader at Lehman College, and I'm an alum for Gutman Community College. Transferring <coughs> to a college with a vast diversity of ethnic studies is impactful for me and my following peers because of the opportunity to learn about our heritage and culture. The sole purpose of this testimony is not to only advocate for ethics studies in our CUNY campuses, but also to highlight the need for more professors of color to teach those courses. By having, professor student, by having the professor-student connection, we'll be able to impact the student at a higher level within the classroom because they're able to learn the material at a personal level. Within the ethics study department, slash program at each CUNY campuses, the student will be able to find a secure place for themselves and resources that will be beneficial. The NYC Council is, um, had given CUNY 
$570,000 to CUNY to fund the ethics study. But yet that money is still less. Needing more, the act is for more funding to the ethics study at different CUNY institutions. Not only, not to take away student pride of learning. So the act is not to, it's to give us more money for these programs, to help us enhance the program that is given, like the resources, the um, everything that's being offered. Um, we are in an institution that is diverse, in a city that is diverse with population and ethnicity, but yet our CUNY campuses and our CUNY our CUNY faculty and staff are not diverse in our education as much, nor is it diverse in our staff and faculty that are teaching those courses. To have those professors there to help us and guide us with their experience is beneficial for our students. Um, for example, take Lehman Mexican Study, for example. We're receiving $285,000 compared to our colleague across CUNY. There are only five full-time five full-time staff at Lehman with over 20 part-time staff. The Mexican study is focused to, on, they're forced to plan only six months into the future instead of a year. Because of the limited funding they receive to provide the resources they currently have for the student. With the budget from NYC Council, they will be able to provide research activity with the budget they were given from the NYC Council, they were able to provide research activity, CUNY MSIA archive and library, educational opportunity initiative, legal counsel for immigrants, and for the students to attend conferences as well. Addition to these programs, Lima Mexican Study provides scholarship and indigenous and diaspora language with Columbia College. With this program, all Lima Study have access to join and apply to the resources being offered. We are here to empower our student voice by giving them the resources they need. So not only with, so at CUNY, we're not only focusing with one study or one ethnic or one culture. We're trying to be open to all of the studies and all of the culture. So yes, Lehman are, um, we have African study, we have Mexican study, yes, we have um, Italian American study and Italian studies, but yet we need more professor within those fields. We need those professor that are there so that they know who we are and to relate to us at a personal level. To have students see their professor up there and saying, I could be in your place or not just that, understanding the material that is being taught to them at a more personal and in-depth level is essential for their um, well-being and educational um, environment. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, everyone. Chairperson Inez Barons, always a pleasure to see you again and to the members of your committee in absence. Uh, my name is Jamel Henderson, and I am the CUNY Rising Alliance Coordinator, and it is good to be in this position now, giving back not only as an active alum, but now as the lead organizer uh, representing over 25 different organizations who are educating, mobilizing, energizing, and um, you know interacting with the public as well as to push the agenda for the city and state to fully fund CUNY once and for all as we did before. Um, you have my testimony, but I felt that is very important that I share as part of our vision plan that students need to share their experiences of what's really happening in the classroom. The public does not know that there is a lack of diversity in our classrooms because it's not talked about. As a proud four-time CUNY student, I've been a part of CUNY for 15 years with two masters and associates and a baccalaureate degree. And I can tell you I've experienced classes where I was the only black student in the room. Most recently at the CUNY Graduate Center where it is 87% white students. When I graduated in the class of 2019, the number of PhD students that I counted that looked like me among a class of over 175 graduating PhD students were five. I had the honor in the spring of 2000, uh, 
18 to teach at, I mean, spring of uh, 2019 this year to teach at Brooklyn College to give back as an adjunct professor. I was one of two black professors in my political science department at that time. So the urgent need for us to be present is there. But it's not just as part of more faculty uh, being a resemblance of us, but there needs to be increased enrollment of our communities in CUNY. The enrollment has, for some colleges, has gone up, but for among African-American, Hispanic, Latinx communities, it has gone down. And you can look at over the trends, especially on campuses like Brooklyn College, Baruch, City, CSI, and a few others that have seen such dramatic changes. More importantly, the importance of Africana studies, the importance of African-American studies, the importance of Asian studies, the importance of Puerto Rican and Latino studies is so crucial, especially in this political environment that we are living in. It is extremely important that the people of our city know the uh, sacrificial contributions of our liberties, of our lives, and of our freedoms that has helped to build this city to be where it is today. If it wasn't for me taking a class on civil rights and black power, which was taught by my mentor, Dr. Jean Theo Harris, a distinguished professor at Brooklyn College, where this semester, uh, this past semester, I was able to come full circle by teaching that same class, I would not have learned that there were 19 heroes who were students who literally fought against administration to push for African American studies and Puerto Rican and Latino studies. If it wasn't for that particular course, I would not have known that there were movements of student leaders that looked like me and others on this table who was at York College, BMCC, City College, who locked campuses' doors because they requested and demanded that there be more faculty and, and staff that looks like them. So these studies are extremely crucial, not only to the well-being and the understanding of what it is to be a student in CUNY, but it's also important to understand the great contributions that we have made in this great concrete jungle of the city of New York, but as part of the, the American fabric known as the United States of America. We are living in a time right now where our city and state should not be playing games and dangling higher education as a carrot on a stick. If we're going to be the next innovators and the leaders that's going to be teaching the next generation of our city and our state, we need to be not only providing more funding for our colleges to have more professors that are a reflection of the city of New York, especially for unfortunate un underprivileged communities, but it's very important that the studies of different ethnicities that represent this great city be taught, understood, and that these individuals will begin to understand the, understand the experience behind our experience in navigating this city going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. My name is Sabina Dorville. I'm a senior at the City College of New York. And I'm here as the Secretary of Senate for Student Government. First and foremost, I would like to say thank you to the Chairperson, um, Council Member Barron, and uh, con the Committee Council for giving me this opportunity. Um, so I'm here today um, about City College and the different experiences a lot of us, people like me, are facing as students. Um, so for many years, we know that CUNY has been facing the same crisis of little to none. Um, faculty of color, especially black professors and women. And although the 1969 protest, which was mainly at CCNY, they re require, uh, requested the five demands, which included hiring faculties that are reflected of the um, city, and especially CCNY, being that it's located in Harlem, we are still seeing less and less of that demand across um, CCNY and also CUNY in general. Right after the protest, some studies, including the Black Study Department and other ethnic studies, were developed into the school, but now they're being devolved into programs instead of being full departments and facing budget cuts continually. And um, right now, there are no 
there's one fa full-time faculty at the Black Studies program, which is the director of the program, mm. and only one full staff member. And all of our um, professors or adjuncts, they're already overtired, underpaid, and also our programs are forced to have the classes cross-listed with other departments that already do not have um, diverse faculty. For example, I'm a political science major, but with a minor in black studies. At the political science department, there's only one black professor, and he's not even a faculty. He only teaches once a year, the fall semester, in ethnic and racial politics in the United States. He's the only one at the political science department. Um, so as student, we can actually count how many professors of color, especially black professors, are on campus. Uh, so personally, as an immigrant from Haiti, being that Haiti is the um, first black country to gain its independence, I was drawn toward the Black Studies Department because I wanted to know more about the experiences of black people in the United States and also on the African continent and relating that to where I come from and my history. And at first I was really happy, but then I was forced to grapple with the reality of not being able to take classes that were once offered because of budget cuts and lack of faculty members. Um, a lot of our classes, like mentioned, um, were course listed. So last semester I took African politics and African American political thought, both being course listed with the political science department and taught by white men. And I had one of, in one of my classes, the first day, the professor actually told us he was not well versed in African American history besides slavery until he started teaching the class. So basically we're being used as guinea pigs in order for him to understand our history, our experiences, and our daily struggle. So a lot of us were shocked by that the first day. This is what we were faced with. And one day, many of us walked out of the classroom because we were so tired of the emotional toll that it was taking on us. And the fact that sometimes he was not receptive to our um, uh, opinions when it comes to our daily struggle, the unconscious racism, and the different belief, the implications of the 13th Amendment. This is not to say that the uh, professors of color would have 100% agree with us, but at least they could have related to us on a personal level and also give us um, advice and actually help us f with our future. I, Because of that, I don't think a lot of the professors that are now teaching black um, classes, black studies classes, a lot of them are not culturally sensitive and also they are not aware that themselves they carry privilege with them and also they have their own personal biases that m uh, many of us students that are taking students of color do not have the privilege to do so. We are, every time we walk out of the our home, we are faced with the reality or reminded that we're black or we are Latinx or because we don't confirm to certain um, binary um, genders that you are less than or you are not human enough. My friends and I who are majoring in or minoring in ethnic studies have to sacrifice our extracurricular activities every semester because we have only 20 or less classes offered and those classes offered are offered only at a specific time which is in conflict with classes that we need for our majors or for our fellowships. So this does not only affect our emotional being, it also hinders us when we are applying for graduate studies because a lot of those graduate studies, like um, applying for law school, they ask letter of recommendation from full-time faculties and tenured um, um, professors. If we are black studies majors, we do not have any full-time faculties. How is that helping us um, prepare for the future? We are supposed to go on and become the person in front of us teaching the class, but if we are not afforded 
the professors that look like us or full-time professors at our own um, studies majors? How we, are we supposed to do that? Um, I believe we should have people that can relate to us. And it's unacceptable because we are living in New York City, a diverse environment, and yet classes at CUNY do not reflect that. The, the programs are getting bigger, but the, pro, um, so the offices, the Black Studies program, the Latinx program are not able to serve us because their budgets have been cut every single year and they cannot, at specifically at CCNY, they cannot hire any professors because we're under hiring freeze. So this is not being faced um, on a daily basis. I'm happy that we have the council members and also CUNY staff that are working endlessly to solve this issue. But I believe in order to truly solve this problem, we have to have professors of color on the hiring committee. And also the hiring committee that are non people of color should take implicit bias um, tests in order for them to see the reality when they're looking at certain people or when they receive their resume and based on their just their name, they can just reject this person from not continuing with the process. I believe there should be educational um, programs in place to make sure that once the professors of color are hired, if they're hired, there should be um, conferences support, financial support, and also um, the fact that they have to face other microaggressions from their own from other professors at their own department. I believe that um, we also need to make ethnic studies classes required because right now I'm taking the philo philosophy class that I really do not care about, but I have to take it because it's required. Why not make a Black Study 101 class required? Why not make a Latin American Black Study class required? It's the same thing. I've been learning about white philosophers or Western history my whole life. So why not bring those classes required and make sure that the students are actually well versed in other people's culture and being um, culturally sensitive. So. I'm here today because I'm really passionate about that. And since I'm a senior, even though I'm graduating next semester, I would like to make sure that the student body that, that elected me, that I'm representing some time in the next two years are able to take those classes and are required to take those classes. Again, thank you for having me and I'm looking forward to working with you all. Thank you. Next. Um, all right, um, good afternoon, um, good afternoon. council members, fellow students, everyone else in the room. Um, my name is Enrique Peña Ropesa. Um, I'm a student from Queens College. I'm a USS delegate. Um, I'm a dreamer, and I'm a proud New Yorker, just like anyone else in this room. Um, I wanted to briefly address the situation regarding my own uh, education in CUNY. I'm a Latin American Studies major at Queens College, intended major. Um, I'm a sophomore, I have not been able to declare that yet. And why? Because of how CUNY is a slowly but steady underfunding and killing our, our ethnic studies programs. Um, out of the about 60 different classes that were listed to fulfill requirements in my career, uh, fewer than 10 were offered in the previous year. And considering classes that I cannot take because of previous requirements that are also not being offered, or Spanish classes that I simply am not allowed to take because of that being my first language. I am currently struggling to find most of the classes that I'd need to graduate with that degree. Uh, I have talked to counselors, to the academic center. I have talked to every office I could ask to like why that was happening uh, and got no answer. And if you ask me the same way I have been asked so many times before, why didn't I go talk to the same department? I have. I didn't know that the chair of the department have taken a sabbatical and no one had been assigned to replace them. And since there's only one person in charge of the whole department, that means it was impossible for me to seek any help. Um, for a whole year, I've been making calls, sending emails, going to different offices, and I feel I've been fooled into a major that I might not be able to complete because the first thing to do to go to for when there's a, a budget cut in CUNY is ethnic studies. Um, Queens College has a history of unrest, which I am proud of. 
uh, 50 years ago, 1969, and all around CUNY students took over campuses to ask for racial justice, to condemn the war, to make sure our university becomes the beacon of hope, not only for a white majority that existed back then, but for people that look like the majority of this room, the majority of New York, people that look like me. Uh, that is how we, uh, we got our ethnic studies departments in the first place. That is how we got SEEK. That is how CUNY opened admission to people of color and became the institution I speak in behalf of today. Uh, but I am tired of speaking up. I am tired of going to hearing after hearing to tell the same sob stories to denounce this systemic problem that New York has let happen for so long. You're not asking the right questions, so let me help you with some. Why is it that in 1976, that year that CUNY finally stopped being a white majority institution, it started charging tuition? Why is it that we keep telling ourselves that the answer to the previous question is a fiscal deficit when we managed to have the biggest expansion of CUNY during the Great Depression? Why is it that when tuition was just imposed, the student money covered about 20% of CUNY budget, but now we finance about 50%? why this investment, why is it that this investment put in the back of middle class students of color? Why can't we spend $11 billion in prisons and a few hundred of millions in police officers and the MTA to lock people up that look like me, but not invest in education for the same demographic for a much lower cost? And let me repeat the word invest because education is not an expense, it's an investment. I cannot speak about education without mentioning my mother. Uh, she studied in Peru to be an educator and then went on to get a law degree in, 19, in 1996. Uh, but when I came to the US in 2016, she came to me, she came with me to work for a minimum wage as a home attendant, facing sometimes discrimination because she doesn't speak English and, but fighting nonstop so I can, I get to be here today speaking my truth and the truth of our people. Uh, so you know why I dare today to criticize a mayor that comes that calls himself progressive and runs for president saying that he supports free college for all, yet underfunds CUNY and applauds cops arresting a lady selling churros in the subway. Mm. Because in that woman, I see my mom, I see my dad, uh, I see nuestros tíos y abuelos, and there you see how the words of the Peruvian poet Cesar Vallejo become a reality. To know more is to be more free because through education we buy our freedom. Through education we thrive in this country. That is why this is important to me because I know the story of my fellow dreamers that came to this country fa facing the biggest hardships just to get this chance. When I came to New York City in 2016, I enrolled in high, in high school and was sent to an international school in Queens for English language learners where almost every student was an immigrant and a big part of them were dreamers like me. And that school did not have access to honors programs, to AP classes, mm -hmm. to sports. But you say you want those students to succeed. You still ask about diversity. And there's a segregated school in Queens where you still fail to provide the most basic level of education in comparison to students in that same building, but in a different school, in a different floor a school that was for citizens and did offer classes like uh, like many AP classes and a personal experience. I, uh, I had an engineering prep in Peru and wanted to take an advanced class in math, but the highest uh, class that I could take in my school was um, Algebra 2. And upstairs, it was AP Calculus. And I wanted to take that class. I talked to my principal. I talked to as many people as possible. It wasn't possible. And so, I was not given a chance. And I cannot even imagine how many students have gone through the same issue in only in my own school. Uh, I supported so, uh, like students in my old high school for a couple years through the ASPID organization founded in 1969 by Dr. Antonio Pantoja that saw back then the same issues we're discussing right now. It took Dr. Pantoja a civil rights lawsuit against New York City in 1973 to, to be able to provide a bilingual education to students in the city, to use the efforts of Dr. Pantoja to segregate students and refuse to give them a basic education is just an insult to everything she stood for. And city officials should be ashamed of the outcome. 
I'm tired of seeing how students like me are pushed out of the educational system and into jails, into the military complex or the streets. I'm tired of trying to help students for when the whole system wants us to fail. So if this hearing was organized to know why do we have issues with lack of, the, of diversity in our schools, I'm giving you the answer. New York City has one of the most segregated school systems in the country. If students of color can't even get through high school, don't expect them to go to college. And by hiking tuition and not giving enough investment in puny, you're purging, purging out students of color like me that wanted an opportunity in this country, in this university system, but pay college out of pocket and cannot afford that anymore. You, made us, you make us choose between a meal and education. So invest in CUNY, invest in schools, invest in us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before you go, I just wanted to say, uh, it's always the students and those who've been through CUNY that are most critical and have the keen insight of what really needs they're not distracted, they're not disengaged, they're at the very heart of what goes on. And in the testimony, you talked about all of the challenges, and you talked about the success of students getting what they wanted, and it's because they fought. It's because they took on presidents, faculty, board of trustees, mayors, governors, to get what they wanted. And nothing comes without a struggle. It never has and it never will. Power concedes nothing without a demand. So we've got to continue to make demands and put action on those demands. So I hear you saying that you're tired, but don't get weary. You know, go to sleep, get a good night's rest, and get up ready for the battle, because the battle continues. It's ongoing. And again, uh, the struggle of the late 60s and 70s is what gave us where we are, and it's true. Tuition came when it was no longer lily white, when other communities came in and made their demands, and at the end of the open access period, open admissions period, that's when we got the tuition imposed, and like you said in your testimony, for various reasons that they put on, on, on the uh, table to say that's why they had to do it. But we've got to continue to battle, we've got to continue to struggle, we've got to continue to call out those forces that are misdirected and keeping us from getting what it is that we are entitled to. And I don't think I've said it yet this hearing, so yes, we are still fighting for free tuition. Yeah. Talking about tuition freeze, yes, but my position is that we need to have free tuition. And uh, it's only because it was free to those students who graduated with a B or better average that I was able to go. My alma mater is Hunter College, and it's only because it was free that I was able to go. Both my parents worked, but we didn't have the money that would have cost if I had to pay tuition. So we've got to continue to be vigilant, continue to organize, not be distracted, and move forward. And I thank you all for all that you're doing and encourage you to get other students involved, mobilize, and willing to challenge and confront those things, those obstacles that are unjust, and that keep them from moving forward. Okay, thank you. And I do have one last panelist. I want to thank you. You're excused. Thank you so much. And our last panelist is Timothy Hunter. And uh, is he here? Oh, there he is. And he's represent. He's the representative from USS. Thank you, welcome, and give us your name and your testimony. Pull the mic close, closer, push the button. Pull it close. Hello? That's it. There we go. Um, so my name is uh, Timothy Hunter. I'm the chairperson of the University Student Senate and CUNY student trustee. Um, I didn't actually plan to be here today, but I'm giving a testimony on behalf of my vice chair, um, Natalie Segev from John Jay Community College. Um, she's the vice chair of senior colleges, and um, she's an amazing individual, and she couldn't make it today because of some prior engagements that she had, and uh, it was an emergency that she had to go attend to. Um, so her testimony reads as says, good afternoon city council members, my name is Natalie Segev. I'm the vice chair of senior colleges for the CUNY University Student Senate and a student at John Jay College. 
Thank you for holding this hearing on ethnic studies at CUNY. The lack of funding in our public higher education system has many negative impacts. One consequence does, that does not get nearly enough attention <laughs> is how underfunded CUNY affects on our ethnic studies departments. The institution prides itself with its diverse students. In the fall of 2018, CUNY reported that the largest student population in all of its schools were Hispanic students at 30.8%. The second largest student population were black students at 24.8%. So why is it that CUNY has an academic curriculum that is not reflective of the students that they are supposed to serve? At John Jay College of Criminal Justice, budget cuts to the Africana Studies Department mean that in the past six years, the department has been unable to hire new faculty members even if it was re to replace a retired faculty member. Around 10 to 15 years ago, the department had 11 full-time faculty members. Since then, the Africana Studies Department has had a steady increase. Their minors pro program more than doubled and they serve over 1,000 students, yet they only have six full-time faculty members. These faculty members not only teach, but create programming and advise their students. As a result, the Africana Studies Department is unable to offer all the courses displayed in the course catalog. Unfortunately, this is an issue across CUNY campuses. The Department of Africana Studies at Lehman will have to offer a significantly reduced amount of courses for the upcoming spring 2020 semester. The department just finalized their spring schedule and cited a reduction in $20,000 in their adjunct budget. This means the department cannot pay for some of the amount of classes that were offered last spring. To provide additional context, Lehman Department of Africana Studies had been able to offer numerous courses on Saturdays in spring 2019. However, they will only be able to offer one class this upcoming spring. This is harmful for many students who cite lack of course offerings being the reason why they cannot fulfill their requirements in a timely manner and delays them from graduating. On the flyer for this hearing, a question was posed. Do you feel that there aren't enough ethnic studies courses ordered to fulfill your degree requirement? I believe just based on the two examples presented that due to budget cuts, the answer is no. No, there aren't enough ethnic studies courses offered to fulfill degree requirements. Um, just to give a little personal anecdote, again, I didn't really didn't expect to be here, but I myself have taken some Africana study classes at my personal schools, New York City College of Technology, and those have been the courses that have changed my life. Those have been the courses that encouraged me to get into student leadership, and those have been the courses that got me where I'm at now. And um, I don't know where I would be without that because those are the same values that my mom, who went to Medgar Evers College, was instilled. And that kind of carried on generationally. So this same push for um, you know diversity in higher education and inclusion has created a, a movement that has encouraged a lot of students to get more involved. And it's put us in places where we can actually succeed. And um, you know I think this is a conversation that has always continued to be had. And as I do more research on this, I know we only got in two weeks ago, and you realize that there's supposed to be a master plan five years ago or four years ago that kind of was supposed to fix and remedy a lot of these things and to see that there hasn't really been enough like you know like emphasis on what you know the university can do for it. I know we have a new chancellor who's amazing. I know we have a new university provost who's also really, really great. Um, I think that like now is the, the time for us to kind of take a real comprehensive look at what it is that we need to do for these departments and for our students. Um, again, the, the, seven, the seven presidents across the board that are interim, I hope to see a, a, a much more diverse group get in. Um, not only diverse in like, you know, um, just race as well, as well as gender. You know, I think that we have, uh, especially the, the new women presidents like uh, President Mason, who was here earlier today, and, um, you know, President Schrader from KCC, and also the interim president at York, who's also a, a woman of color, President Eanes. I think these are presidents that have, like, you know, a huge emphasis on student services because that's their background. And I think that when we have more culturally responsive administration, there's like a trickle-down effect that, um, you know, now, like, it trickles down to our faculty and to our students um, because it helps seeing people that look like you. And um, I think that just highlighting uh, the faculty disparity, again, just looking at some of these documents is very disturbing. You know, um, five, less than 5% full-time faculty across the board um, that are, like, not only but men and women of color. Um, I think things like that, like, you know, it's, it's very some, – it's something that I think that we should all be taking a real comprehensive look at because it's important that, like, you know – where we're being sensitive. I know like even me, I'm a part of New York City Men's Teach, which is an initiative to kind of increase the amount of men of color in the classroom because I actually want to be a teacher and an educator that um, students can look at and say, wow, well, you know, that's Mr. Hunter. Like, you know, that's someone that looks like me in front of the classroom. And I think that um, with uh, 
city council. I know we have uh, people that are extremely receptive to these things, and I appreciate you know Chairperson Barron um, for being like a huge advocate for everything that you know involves diversity and gender equity and getting people that look like us in the classroom, and not only in the classroom but also in those offices because those are important as well. And I think with this new chancellery, um, it's important, and this hearing was needed because it highlights the situations that we need to kind of like take, you know, like we need to take action on, um, especially as it relates to administration and higher education diversity and the retention of our students because at the end of the day, we want all of our students to succeed. And these students wouldn't be here if they didn't want that. Um, so, and I also wanna just thank the students and Jamel for coming out and everyone else that had the opportunity to stick around. I know I went late and I know we are really late as well, but um, I just wanna, appreciate and let you all know that um you know the students and on behalf of all the students at cuny thank you all for the work that you all are trying to do um especially when it relates to diversity because um it's important that we're being sensitive to all these topics and uh any questions that i can ask uh, i'll definitely be willing to an uh, answer them to the best of my ability but thank you thank you so much just want to encourage you in your journey to move forward and to be a model as you say for those who are looking at you and you just need to know that people are always watching you wherever it is. So mm -hmm. just continue to be strong, continue to be vocal, uh, be an example to others around you and encourage them to use their voice and use their presence and use their body and use their intelligence to make sure that we can advance to get what we rightfully need. Mm -hmm. And it's been pitiful, the number, the, the steady decline in uh, faculty that's reflective of the population that they serve, but we've got to continue to put the pressure on. And now, as, as has been cited before, is a great possibility mm -hmm. with all of the new uh, presidents that are, go that are going to be appointed. It's a great possibility. So we'll see what happens as these positions are filled and what kind of, um, what kind of agenda presidents insist they see from the faculty in their schools mm -hmm. and what they are doing to help the faculty departments realize, yes, white men have great privilege mm -hmm. and power and the ability to, uh, to make sure that they maintain that power. Mm -hmm. So we've got to challenge that and make sure, no, we've got to break this glass ceilings and the racial bars and all of that to make sure that we get equity. So I want to thank everyone who's come to testify. Seeing no other panelists, this hearing is now adjourned. Thank you.